Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the commissioners and the citizens of this county. It's our pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, I call this meeting to order. Let's have our roll call. I'm informed we got to vote by hand today. Uh, oh, we got to vote by hand. All is present but one. Do we have a motion for Mr. Webb? So moved. So Second. All right. Mr. Webb has an uh, engagement required his uh, being there and not to be with us today. Thank you. All ready for that motion. Let's vote. Motion to excuse him. Thank you. Uh, now let's all stand and we'll have our indication and pledge, please. <coughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your many blessings upon us. We thank you once again for the opportunity of assembling together as a community. We thank you, Father, for each one that is here, the interest and the commitment we have from the citizens of our community. We pray that you might bless us as a, as a county, bless us this morning as a board as we deliberate the various issues. We pray that we will make those decisions that are pleasing in your sight. Well, Father, we know that if we make those decisions that are pleasing in your sight, they will be those decisions that are best for the community that we represent. These blessings we pray in your holy name. Amen. 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 Please face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Play ball. Yeah. Um, let's see. Mr. Manager, do we have any additions or corrections to the agenda? Yes, sir. We'd like to add one. Yes, sir. We'd like to add one item to the agenda this morning. We were going to bring this on October the 1st, but with the impending um, storm coming our way, we've got a, an agreement with NCDOT for de debris removal on the secondary road right of ways that gives us the opportunity to assist DOT in removing that debris, gives us permission to do it, then seek reimbursement by, from FEMA. So we'd like to add that to the agenda if we could. All right. Do we have a motion to approve? Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. So ordered. All right. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, I believe you're up. Good morning, James. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, after about four or more years in uh, receiving the funding for the Candlewick sewer project, we're pleased to announce this morning uh, that the project is operational, number one. All the homes have been connected and all the funds have been expensed. So today we're before you to ask for a public hearing uh, for the closeout of this project and there's some other formalities that have to be worked out with the state. So just to recap a few things, uh, we did receive $3 million for this sewer line extension. This is extending out along Stantonsburg Road. This is the force main here. It's extended about two and a half miles from West Point subdivision. And that's just south of the intersection of 264 West and Stantonsburg Road. So the force main runs under the new Southwest bypass and on to Candlewick subdivision or the sanitary district here. You may recall we also purchased property adjacent to there for a pump station. This is to allow um, an increased capacity on the line and of course this area with this pump station that's been installed can serve a very large area even as far as Mazingo Road which is <coughs> just to the west just off the side of the map. So within the development, you remember we had to pare things down, costs went up after we got the funding, and we were able, we um, were serving some properties on the north side of Stantonsburg as well as going into the heart of Candlewick subdivision. So we've already bored under the road here at Stantonsburg, and there is a potential, you can see the larger Candlewick uh, sanitary district boundary here good potential to expand there in the future with funding being provided. Here's actually a shot of the pump station, a lot of equipment on this site, a lot of expensive equipment, including a backup pump housed here. This is actually the deep well here. Uh, this is just a picture of the connections that took place over the last couple of weeks. And you can see this running right up to the house the plumbing of the home is now tied into the system itself. 
lot of roads were impacted as we went in to uh, put, install the lines. So here's just one at the intersection of Cricket and Stantonsburg. Within the subdivision, this is where the main trunk line came through the wooded area off Stantonsburg on to Chatham Way. And just another picture, and again, DOT, these are state maintained roads, so DOT again will uh, ensure that they meet their standards before the uh, project uh, is wrapped up. So today, uh, as part of this, we are required to have a close out public hearing for anyone that would like to come to speak about how the funds have been used. Um, all of these uh, activities have been completed. However, there are some uh, budgetary things. We'll be working with Greenville Utilities. Remember, they were a partner in this project. They helped upsize the line for increased capacity. So there is still some budgetary things we'll be working out over the next month or so. So uh, after the public hearing today, uh, we're asking that you authorize staff to submit all the closeout documents and authorize the chairman to sign all the documents in that closeout package. <coughs> and with that, Mr. Chairman, we're ready for the public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Rhodes. Uh, I declare the public hearing open. Mr. Manager, do we have anyone signed up for that? Uh, nobody signed up unless there's somebody in the audience who'd like to come forward. Anyone in the audience would like to speak to this issue? If not, then I declare the public hearing closed. What's the pleasure to board? Motion to approve. Second. All, right. All in favor indicate by raising your right hand. So ordered. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Elliott, I believe you up. Okay, next for, for the items for presentation, we have got the economic development study um, on the convergent and creative studies for economic development, which was a study that was commissioned by the, um, the county, the city of Greenville, um, the Committee 100, and um, Greenville Utilities Commission. And I will turn this over to um, Rick Kiernan and Crystal Morphus, and they will um, make this presentation to you. Good morning. Good to have you with us, sir. Thank you, sir, for having me with, or having me with you uh, this morning. My name is Rick Kiernan. I am a principal with Convergent Nonprofit Solutions. Uh, we help counties and municipalities and economic development organizations around the country take their economic development efforts to the next level. Uh, I've been doing this about 22 years, uh, although we work around the country. I've worked with about 20 clients around North Carolina, and I have to say I'm particularly excited about this engagement because I grew up in Greenville. Uh, this is home for me. Uh, I live in Raleigh now, uh, but for those of you who may remember Burroughs Welcome back in the day, uh, my father worked there in the 70s and 80s until he was uh, transferred to their U.S. headquarters in Research Triangle Park. Uh, so it's been a delight to come back home uh, and see this community that I grew up in just grow and thrive uh, over the last 30 years. And uh, we can always turn those fans on if we get hot and humid again, so I understand that. So uh, I've put together about 20 slides to summarize the work that we have done for you over the last six months. Uh, I'm going to present some of those slides to you, then Crystal Morfils will come up and talk in a little bit more detail about uh, a public-private partnership and what that might look like should you choose to go that direction. Uh, the agenda for what I'm going to present uh, to you today, I want to give you an overview uh, of the feasibility study in terms of how we conducted it, talk about the roundtable discussions uh, that we facilitated, uh, as well as the interviews we conducted uh, during the feasibility study, and most importantly, share our findings, uh, what we learned. I'm not here today to suggest or recommend you go one direction or the other. My job in this process was to collect information and report it back to you. Uh, to that end, you're going to get a copy of our final report. It's going to include a heck of a lot more detail, certainly, than the uh, 20 or so slides uh, I've included today. And then I'm going to wrap up with campaign recommendations. And by campaign, I mean fundraising campaign. In any public-private partnership, 
certainly you're leveraging the expertise of the private sector and bringing those folks into the fold and helping them understand economic development uh, and getting everybody on the same, <coughs> same page pointing in the same direction, but you're also leveraging their financial support uh, and bringing that to bear to supplement uh, public sector financial resources. So I want to talk more about what we learned there. So in terms of the overview itself, how we conducted the feasibility study, uh, we were retained in February uh, of this year, uh, conducted roundtable discussions with over 100 business and community leaders uh, across the county. It was very important to us that we had broad representation uh, and broad input uh, from a number of folks. Uh, we developed materials for the feasibility study itself, and that really came straight out of those roundtable discussions. Uh, a sketch, a four-page outline of what a five-year economic development plan might look like, uh, as well as a public-private partnership, some of the details there, should you choose to go that direction. We conducted three weeks of one-on-one -on -one interviews last month in August. Our goal was to sit down and visit with about 40 to 60 individuals, and we ended up conducting 61 interviews with 69 business and community leaders across the county. I tell you, I've done this 22 years. I've done it all over the country. That in and of itself, to do that many interviews over a three-week period of time, tells us there's a lot of interest uh, in economic development across the county uh, in, in learning in terms of what you might create going forward. So the roundtables themselves, again, we wanted really broad representation. We wanted a lot of input, public sector, private sector, all the municipalities, businesses, large, medium, and small. So we sent out over 300 invitations uh, to participate. We had over 100 people uh, join that process. So we had a response rate of close to 35%, which from my experience working around the country is, is pretty impressive. Three themes seem to, uh, to come out of that, and one is that economic growth could be stronger. Folks were quick to say, we've got a lot of good things happening right here. We've got the medical center. We've got ECU. We have a couple of really incredible economic engines that are driving a lot of growth. Um, but what that ended up leading into is that we also have a lot of players uh, in the economic development arena. Certainly, we have the lead economic development agency, uh, the Pitt County Development Commission, driving that effort. And then you also have the city of Greenville, a number of other municipalities with their own economic development efforts, Greenville Utilities. And so the thought was that with more collaboration, you would have even more success than, the, than you're realizing today. So coming out of those discussions over the period uh, of four days in April, uh, we sketched out what might look like a five-year economic development plan uh, with some details around a public-private partnership. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the public-private partnership, but very little. I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the fundraising piece of this. I'm going to leave the details of the public-private partnership uh, and questions you might have to, uh, to Crystal Morphis. So after conducting roundtable discussions, that's where we have folks in a group setting and we're sharing a lot of information uh, in public. Now we want to take what we've learned from that and start meeting with people one-on-one -on -one and really drill down, specifically from that person's uh, entity, whatever that entity is, the county, uh, any of the municipalities, their particular business, uh, their college, their university. What do they want to see in an economic development plan? What, what is most important to them? Uh, and we assure confidentiality uh, when we're looking for those types of questions. It was very important that I could come back to you and, and say, boy, you're not going to believe what Bill said. You're not going to believe what Mary said. They needed to feel safe that they could be candid and tell us what they like, but also tell us what they dislike. Um, and so we assure confidentiality. And what I've done is uh, aggregate all of those findings uh, over the next uh, eight or nine slides that I'm going to share with you. Certainly, we wanted to get their thoughts on your current economic development efforts. We wanted to talk about uh, a public-private partnership conceptually, what that might look like, what, what they liked about it, what they disliked about it, what some of their concerns, quite frankly, might be, and then talk about the five-year plan. Again, what really resonated uh, with them. The last two bullets right there, that really gets down to the fundraising. Um, if you were to choose to go down this path and create a public-private partnership, uh, certainly there's a transition plan to do that. But secondarily and concurrently, 
there's a fundraising campaign. You need to go out there and actually raise funding from the private sector, something that hasn't been done at, at this level before uh, in Pitt County. So we need to get a sense of what might be out there financially, uh, as well as fundraising leadership. In every capital campaign, there's always a group of 12 or 15 or so folks who say, this is important. I'm going to roll up my sleeves. I'm going to be part of a campaign leadership team. I'm going to drive this forward. Uh, and we need to get a sense of, are there individuals here in Pitt County willing to step up and be a part of that? Because nobody's going to write a check because I asked them, even though I'm from Greenville. They're going to write a check because business and community leaders say, this is important. We need you to step up. We need you to be a part of that. So we wanted to gauge the interest and willingness of participants to do that. So who did we talk to? This is a good breakdown. Uh, about three quarters of the interviews were with businesses, uh, primarily because they have not uh, been a part of economic development in the past yeah, at this level. Great. So would they be willing to underwrite uh, an economic development plan financially? Uh, certainly we wanted to talk with the public sector, and we did about 15% of our interviewees were from the public sector, 8% from education, ECU, PCC. Uh, I mentioned, by the way, we conducted 61 interviews. We sent out invitations to well over 100. It was just a matter of fitting into people's calendars uh, in, uh, in August uh, to the degree that we could. So what do we find? We typically start fairly generally. We ask folks, how would you characterize the economy in Pitt County? Excellent, good, fair, poor. Very few people said excellent or poor. It was more in the middle and really towards the upside. Uh, the blue you see there, 71% believe the economy is pretty good uh, in Pitt County. They're, they're pretty excited with the growth there. 23% obviously uh, not as, as optimistic. We started to hear a little bit here, you know, things are going good, but they could be going better. Uh, and that's where we started talking a little bit more about uh, a public-private partnership. That seemed to be a general theme here. We asked folks, what do you see as the challenges to economic growth uh, in the county? Uh, more than anything, we, we just heard about the, the fractionalized economic development efforts. Again, no, no criticism. It's just we have a number of people doing economic development in the county here. And it seems like if there was more collaboration, we could probably be more successful. Some of the other things we heard, a lack of certified sites uh, in, in the economic development circles. We, the old adage is you can't sell from an empty wagon. Uh, you have an abundance of land. You don't have an abundance of certified sites. So that makes you less competitive to your counterparts, not just here in North Carolina, but in other parts of the country. A lack of skilled and unskilled workers. You are not the only one in that boat. We are hearing that all across the state. We're hearing that all across the country. We're working in about three dozen communities right now. Uh, we are facing a labor shortage across our country like we've never seen in our history. There's no easy solutions, but certainly uh, it is a challenge. Your major employers and in industry brought that to our attention uh, many times that they are finding it very challenging to hire people, to find people, to hire them, and to retain them. Uh, traffic and congestion, uh, especially when ECU is in session. Uh, certainly we saw this, and we saw it in August. It's, the school wasn't even in there yet. It's, um, we're doing six interviews a day, 8 a.m., 9, 30, 11 in the morning, 1, 2, 30, 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And that gives us about an hour to spend with folks and then about 30 minutes to drive to our next appointment. There was so much interest. A lot of times we end up talking about 75 minutes with folks, so we only had about 15 minutes to get across town. More times than not, we were calling ahead to let folks know we were running a few minutes behind. So traffic, not surprisingly, was brought to our attention, <laughs> and we experienced it firsthand. A, a lot of your business travelers uh, brought the airport reliability issue. Uh, we heard a lot of uh, stories about delayed flights, canceled flights, uh, and a lot of these folks are making the drive into Raleigh uh, to hit RDU to do their flying because uh, they're, they're, the, the reliability is just not as consistent as they'd like uh, here in, in Pitt County. Um, and then lastly, the perception of Pitt County schools. We didn't ask any questions about this, but people brought it up, especially the manufacturers and major employers, said it, it's challenging to recruit uh, people to Pitt County because especially if they have children, they're going to go online, they're going to do some research, they're going to research uh, test scores, graduation rates, um, and there's some concern right now that, uh, from their perspective, that that makes it a challenge for them to recruit people. Most people caveated that with, but it is getting better. Uh, so that was nice to hear. Now, of course, 
we talk about the challenges, we also have to flip the coin and say, what are the strengths? What's, what, what really makes sense for economic growth right here? The two we heard over and over and over, Vidant Medical Center and East Carolina University, the two giant economic engines you have uh, in Pitt County really driving a lot of the growth that you have here. We also heard about Pitt Community College, great for workforce training. The manufacturers brought that up uh, significantly over and over in terms of training, not only people they need to hire, but existing workforce so that because technology changes so often that they can send their folks over to PCC and get the training uh, that they need. Um, quality of life, I can certainly uh, testify to that having spent the first 14 years of my life here uh, and a lot of fond memories. A lot of people say we've got a great quality of life. If we can just get people here, fly to town, check out uh, Pitt County and just drive around, they, they'll be hooked. Uptown revitalization, a lot having in, happening in your uptown, uh, certainly. And a lot of people brought that up, especially when you're talking about recruiting millennials to town, young professionals. Uh, they want that uptown. They like to have upper story housing, walk around, hit restaurants, coffee shops. Uh, that's, that means a lot to them, and you've got a lot happening right here. And then the abundance of land. Certainly we heard that. There's a flip side of that. Obviously, we need more certified sites but the abundance of land uh, was seen as a real benefit. How do you perceive current economic development efforts? Uh, very effective, effective, moderately effective, and, and not effective. Obviously, everybody wants 100% up in the very effective. I can tell you, doing this around the country never happens. Never happens. Uh, you certainly want a lot of the folks that are uh, saying it's not effective, and even a number of the folks saying it's moderately effective, you would rather those be uh, rating current economic development efforts as either effective or very effective. Of course, the follow-up question is, what would change your mind? What would make that either, if, if you're saying it is moderately effective, what would it make it effective? Or if you're saying it's effective, what would it make it very effective? And a lot of folks talked about if we had more collaboration, uh, with our economic development efforts, we think we would be more successful. How important is it to unify those economic development efforts? 74% believe it's very important. So that's, that's not surprising when you look at the bottom part of this, this chart here in terms of the folks ranking it not effective or moderately effective, most of those jumped right up to saying it's very important that we unify our efforts. Um, how do you unify your efforts? That's still to be determined. Again, this is all the aggregation of, uh, of information that we pulled from these 61 interviews to, to share with you today. Uh, a few folks don't see it uh, as being important, but you can see 94% say it's either important or very important that you collaborate and unify uh, your current economic development efforts. Do you create supporting a public-private partnership? Almost four out of five people do. Um, this was actually higher than I expected. We've done this where we certainly we've worked with existing public-private partnerships to help them go out and raise additional funding to increase their economic <coughs> development effectiveness in a Wayne County or an Alamance County. Uh, and, and they understand a public-private partnership, but it's never existed here. So it was surprising, frankly, that it was this high to me. Uh, usually you would see that 17% slice unsure being larger because a lot of people just don't know about it. There's still a lot of unknowns in terms of what a public-private partnership might look like. I think to some degree it's because so many counties around you, when you're looking at um, a Wayne County or Craven County or Onslow County, Nash and Edgecombe counties have these existing public-private partnerships uh, that people have heard about them, seen them, uh, know of uh, their, their structures or their success, um, that there was probably so much interest. What are the most critical factors to you if you go down this road and create a public-private partnership? There were two general themes. Uh, one was funding, and it can't be driven by just a handful of folks. It has to be broad-based. It's got to be public sector. It needs to be private sector. In the public sector, this can't be a Greenville-centric, for example. It's got to be all the municipalities. Uh, in the private sector, this has, can't just be large companies. It needs to involve medium companies as well as small companies. And then the governance structure itself needs to represent that. Certainly Pitt County, all the municipalities, uh, as well as businesses, large and small, and what was made clear to us is no pay to play. 
It doesn't matter the, the, the investment level that you make into this organization, whether it's a million dollars or a thousand dollars, there's one vote if you're on the board. So what those details are, that still remains to be seen. I'm gonna let Crystal walk through that a little bit with you, but this was the interest level uh, that we heard. And what's interesting here is that certainly we interviewed a number of businesses, but we also interviewed a number of municipalities. Uh, and found more support than I think they are also uh, than we expected in terms of the creation of a public-private partnership. So the five-year plan itself, how did that test? There were seven initiatives, and we walked through folks. And, and by the way, your final report is going to include a copy of this four-page executive summary of that proposed plan. It gives uh, this uh, each initiative as well as four or five bullet points underneath each one just to sketch out and get a sense from folks what's most important to you. Not surprising to us, the top two are going to be new business attraction to the county, existing business retention and expansion. You're always looking to bring new companies in, certainly. But what surprised me, and certainly we've seen a shift in this over uh, probably the last four or five years, is a shift from trying to focus outside the county borders and trying to attract new companies here to a real shift in focusing on making sure the companies are here, you keep them here, and make sure that you are knocking over any roadblocks they're experiencing to growth and try to do your best to help them expand, identify potential expansion opportunities uh, through trips to headquarters, help them by recruiting uh, suppliers to town, Whatever it's going to do, whatever it takes to make it easier to do business right here in Pitt County. I've done this 22 years. I have never had 100% of the folks we asked this question to rank it as an 8, 9, or 10 as a top priority. So there is real interest in making sure that you are taking care of your businesses uh, right here, which is encouraging to see. I suspect as the workforce challenge continues, you're going to start seeing a lot more of this. Uh, industrial parks and sites, not surprisingly, I shared with you, you do have an abundance of land, but you lack uh, certified sites, so there's a real interest there. A lot of people in that space, commercial developers, uh, commercial realtors, uh, talked about this one and, and, and really uh, shared with us how important it is and that it makes it difficult to compete with other communities around the state and other areas of the country. Once we, so those are the, probably the top three. That's what resonated the most with folks. What's interesting, when we get to workforce development, it's a challenge. Everybody said it is extremely important, but they wondered whether the, the public-private partnerships should be the one driving this effort. They talked about the chamber, ECU, uh, PCC, uh, another of, uh, a number of organizations that are already operating in this space. When you start talking about raising private sector funding, the one thing you do not want is redundancy. If somebody's already doing it, especially if they're doing it well, do not do it all over again. And so they, there were some questions about, yeah, yes, it's very important, but we want to make sure that if there are already people doing this, already organizations doing this, and they're doing it effectively, should the partnership play a role? Certainly, but should it be a major pillar, a major initiative? Maybe, maybe not. That needs to be fleshed out. Legislative advocacy, uh, there were a sense in, among a number of folks that um, Pitt County does not have uh, much of a presence uh, or doesn't have as much clout as they would like in Raleigh, uh, that there's just not a lot of awareness once you get east of Interstate 95, uh, and a lot of folks want to change that, and they believe that this organization, by uh, bringing on board some folks that are skilled uh, in that arena, can uh, make sure they're raising Pitt County's awareness uh, at the General Assembly in Raleigh. Small business and entrepreneurship, again, this is one of these things that's super important to folks, um, but they look at Vines, they look at uh, a number of other organizations out there uh, that are already operating in the space. You have a rich history of entrepreneurialism uh, in Pitt County, and they're not so sure the, the public-private partnership should be focused on this. Again, yet to be determined, uh, but when I look at this and I look at those top three initiatives, those are the ones that, that tested most favorably. The last piece there, that's more investor relations making sure you keep everybody informed and aware uh, as you go through a five-year plan with your metrics uh, in terms of how you're doing. Um, but most people didn't see that needed to be one of your uh, seven initiatives, uh, that that could just be part of, uh, part of doing business. So if every, 
economic development plan, you certainly have metrics. You need to determine, <coughs> have you been successful? Are you being successful? Uh, what changes do you need to make as you're going down this path over a five-year period of time? So through those, uh, those roundtable discussions, in addition to the plan we develop right there, we also came up with uh, some proposed metrics to test with folks over a five-year period of time. The first one, 2,750 jobs over five years. That's roughly 550 per year. Uh, a lot of folks said, boy, that'd be great. I think it's a little ambitious. Not only that, the 20% there that say it's, or almost 20% that say it's too aggressive, those are your major employers. Those are your, your industry. Those are the folks who already have a tough time finding skilled workers and are saying, boy, if you go out there and try to create another 2,000 or 2,500 or 3,000 jobs, you're going to make it tougher for us to find skilled workers. So there's got to be a balance there in terms of talent, attraction, retention, and development, as well as job creation. The capital investment uh, tested really well, 1.25 billion. That's roughly 250 million per year over that five-year period. Uh, BRE visits, that's business retention and expansion. That's going out to your existing business, making sure you understand them, knocking over those roadblocks, uh, doing whatever you can to help them succeed. Again, making those headquarter visits, helping to recruit suppliers to town comes out to about 160 visits per year, roughly three per week. Most folks thought that seems about right. Uh, 300, uh, at least 300 fully developed acres and at least uh, 300 certified acres. Uh, most people said, yes, absolutely. We can't sell from an empty wagon. Uh, and then the satisfied and very satisfied ranking uh, ratings. That's from those BRE visits, by the way, when you're out there talking with folks. If you go out and survey your existing industry, how would you rate the economic <coughs> development um, um, support and assistance that you're getting? And to make sure you're looking for a satisfied or a very satisfied ranking uh, at least 85% of the time. If I summarize this, I would say people love the idea that you're going to measure your economic development. They love the idea that you're going to have specific outcomes uh, and you can hold a public-private partnership accountable should you go that direction. If anything, what we heard is, it's a pretty ambitious plan. If anything, because a public-private partnership is going to have ramp-up time, and you don't have certified sites right now, that's going to take some time, and marketing is going to take some time. So to hit these metrics, if, you were, if we were having this conversation five years from now, and you went forward, you went down this path, and you go out and raise funding, and I'm talking about doing another fundraising effort after that for another five-year campaign, these metrics could be very appropriate. But because you would be in startup phase, folks think that you might be a little ambitious uh, with this plan right here. So, of course, where's the money going to come from? So if we're out there talking to all these businesses as well as municipalities and getting a sense, do you think it's possible to raise $2.75 million uh, to implement this plan? This is on top of uh, funding uh, that's already provided from the public sector, so roughly $550,000 per year. Do you think a campaign would be successful to raise that funding? Three out of five people said yes. Uh, frankly, that's, that's higher than I would have expected. We just did this in Rutherford County uh, with their development commission last year going forward. It was less than that because, and, and the primary reason, you've never done this before. And, and so typically that's where we would see that slice of the pie that's 31% that's unsure. I would expect that to be higher. $2.75 million to raise from the private sector as well as municipalities, um, that is significant funding. Uh, and by the way, when I say municipalities, um, what I'm doing there is I'm taking out Pitt County and City of Greenville. So I'm talking about the other municipalities in the county as well as the private sector. Those are the folks we are looking uh, to talk to about a campaign to raise $2.75 million. Um, but only 11% categorically did not think it could be raised. The follow-up question, if you don't think that's realistic, what do you think is? I'd say 1 to 1.5 million was generally uh, the, uh, the range that we heard most often. Follow-up question, I mentioned this before, it's not just going out there and trying to raise the, the money, it's also getting the right business and community leaders to lead the charge, uh, to volunteer their time, to roll up their sleeves, and be a part of a capital campaign to raise the funding to actually implement and launch a public-private partnership. So we asked folks, are you willing to play a role? Again, nobody's going to write a check because I asked them. 
They're going to write a check because some of your really well-respected business and community leaders say, this is important. We need this to happen. Just think of everything we could be. 42% of the people we interviewed said yes. I'd be a part of that, which is a great number. We typically need 12 to 15, so if you look at that, uh, you, you, you've definitely got enough support to go out there. But another 46% said, you know, I, I might. Yeah, it, business is, is really good. It's, it's strong. It's, I'm busy. I'm not working 40 hours a week. I'm doing 50 or 60 hours a week. It, I'm, I might be able to play a role. I'm just not sure what that role might be. Then the, we would also ask, would you at least be a door opener? Would you provide an introduction? If we're going out there and we need to make sure that we're getting in front of a bunch of businesses across the county asking for their financial support and you have a relationship and we can't get in that door, would you at least open the door and provide an introduction? And we had over half the people we interviewed said yes. So you've already got 30 or so folks who are saying, yes, I'm willing to play a role in a campaign to move this thing forward. And then another uh, maybe 20 or so saying I'd, I'd consider it depending on my schedule and some other things. So I'm going to wrap this up by talking about campaign recommendations. And this is from the fundraising piece. And I'm going to turn it over to Crystal because she's going to walk you through what a public-private partnership might look like should you go this direction. We share with folks a fundraising table that illustrates the types of commitments we would need and the number at each level to successfully raise $2.75 million. Um, and we get a sense from them where their financial support might lie on that fundraising table. Maybe it's five to ten thousand dollars over five years. Maybe it's twenty-five to fifty. Maybe it's a hundred to two hundred thousand. There's no wrong answer. It's just if the plan goes forward and it's modified appropriately, and the public-private partnership has the right governance structure, a lot of if-then statements. Where might your support might where where might it be? We learned uh, from folks, these are, they're pointing to an area on this chart ranging from 1855000 up to roughly $2.5 million uh, from businesses across the county as well as some of your smaller municipalities, a willingness to play a role and financially support and invest in an organization. Based on our experience in doing this around the country, that tells us that a campaign to raise somewhere between $2.5 and $3 million, uh, exclusive of uh, the city of Greenville and Pitt County, we think would be successful uh, over a five-year period of time. So roughly $500,000 to $600,000 per year. In terms of the campaign timing, I think you're probably looking at an eight-month campaign uh, for a community the size of Pitt County. Uh, and that would run concurrent with uh, a, a transition plan or a creation of uh, a, a public-private partnership. And I think that's it. Crystal, thank you. Thank you, sir. glad to be with you. Um, I'm Crystal Morphis with Creative Economic Development. And um, before I became a consultant, I should say I was a local economic development director. I was uh, like Brad Hufford. In fact, my first job in economic development was existing business retention and expansion. And I worked for a public-private partnership. So when we get to the question and answer, I'll be glad to answer questions from a staff perspective, too, because it was the type of organization I worked for um, when I was early in my career. <coughs> I was engaged, or my firm was engaged, after the, uh, Rick mentioned the process with the community meetings in which a public-private partnership really boiled to the top, this higher level of collaboration for economic development. Our firm was engaged because one of our areas of expertise is organizational development for, for economic development groups, and we have quite a bit of experience in helping communities determine the best structure for their program and helping them um, uh, develop that structure and then to put it in place. So that's what I'm going to spend my time talking about today. And then we'll have some question and answer. So through those meetings, this um, indication of 
of interest in a higher level of collaboration and how that could be organized in a public-private economic development organization, uh, one of the top things that we started talking about is what are some of the advantages. And that first one is collaboration. Um, it's just not the county and the private sector. It also involves municipalities who want to be engaged in your economic development efforts. It involves educational institutions. Uh, Rick mentioned uh, the number one challenge of economic development right now is, uh, is workforce. And so educational institutions have to be actively engaged in your economic development program. And also ally agencies, uh, chambers of commerce, uh, downtown, uptown organizations, tourism organizations, we're all working for economic growth. And a public-private partnership can be that umbrella organization that really brings all economic development interests together and leverages them. Um, I'll just give you one example. I was in a community one time where the Economic Development Group had a Quality of Life magazine, the Chamber had a Quality of Life magazine, the CVB had a Quality of Life magazine, all these groups, when if they'd actually spent some time talking, they could have developed one much better uh, 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 marketing material and had a higher level of efficiency. So that's just one example, but there, there are many of those. It's also an advantage from a customer service perspective. If I'm a company considering moving to Pitt County, I want a single point of contact. I want a single liaison that can help me with my questions that I have about starting a business here, purchasing a building. And right now, I think there's some confusion from the customer perspective. Uh, do I work with the city of Greenville? Do I work with the Development Commission? Who do I work with? So from a customer perspective, you want a seamless uh, pathway no matter how large or small that business, and this efficient pathway can lead to higher level of customer service. It re uh, reduces uh, redundancies, reduces duplication. I mentioned the whole example of marketing materials. Uh, this is probably not the case in Pitt County, but I've worked in other places where the county developer will, will go and call on a site selection consultant, in, say, in Atlanta. And the very next month, someone from their largest city is there calling on them again. And the marketing message may not be consistent. So efficiency and collaboration, reducing duplication, of course, leveraging resources is important. Flexibility is really important. Um, a nonprofit economic development organization provides a lot of flexibility. Oftentimes, for example, you may need to get a phase one study done very quickly, and a nonprofit can engage someone to do that on a fast turnaround for a prospect. Um, I have one client who manages their incubator out of a nonprofit 501c3 economic development group so they can negotiate leases very quickly. And so there's a flexibility both in contracting and negotiations that can take place in a 501c3. It limits liability. If you think of um, private developers, just think of developers that do commercial development. They put every shopping center in its own LLC because it limits liability from other interests. Most economic development groups will develop property in nonprofit corporations as a way to limit liability to county government, city government, and to limit liability with other organizations. So it's a way for you to limit, de to limit development liability. And then just as Rick mentioned, raising funds. Uh, foundations can give to 501c3s. So you can apply for foundation grants and giving. You can apply for other funding sources, and of course the private sector is very unlikely to write a check directly to government for economic development, but they will for, uh, to a nonprofit organization. So it opens the door not only to private sector funding, but also other avenues of funding as well. Now there are perceived disadvantages, and I want to talk through those as well, of a nonprofit organization. The first uh, perceived disadvantage is lack of government control. Uh, this is really the number one concern of uh, governments when we talk about uh, moving to a public-private partnership. But I will tell you that local government will always retain control of economic development because you control money of, for water and sewer lines, and that's where development goes. You control money for other utility development and transportation. You can guide transportation funding, and that's where development goes. And you will always control incentives. You, by the control of infrastructure and incentives, you guide development. Also, governments make an annual appropriation to economic development groups. If the economic development group is not meeting the metrics that they have outlined to you, they're not following the program of work that you have approved and endorsed and been a part of developing, 
you don't make an annual appropriation. Um, in Union County, where Monroe is, they had a five-year agreement with the government that says this is the program of work we're going to do in return for the appropriation that you're going to give us, and they gave them an annual report, and at the end of the five years they reported, and you could show that they met the expectation. So you will always, um, always have uh, control through agreements, um, MOUs, service agreements, however you structure it, but remember, ultimately, with infrastructure and incentive dollars, you will always direct economic development. I mentioned incentives with the control uh, piece as well. Another uh, perceived disadvantage is transparency. It is our recommendation as a best practice for all nonprofit economic development organizations to act um, as, as you would if you're a public entity. So be as open as you can in your nonprofit and your public-private partnership. Uh, most of my clients will allow people to attend their meetings. Um, some of them publish their minutes on their website. They go into closed session, just like other boards would for confidential matters. They produce annual reports. They make available publicly an annual audit of their finances. So there are best practices to ensure transparency so that the public is aware and kept up to date, and of course all the investors and stakeholders are. So investor representation, and Rick had mentioned um, uh, about how different companies and organizations could be involved. All units of uh, local government would be represented in a public-private partnership either through the county organization, because through you, all municipalities are represented, of course. But when we get to the organizational um, uh, governance structure, we recommend that all local government managers be ex officio non-voting members to the board. So all uh, municipalities will have some representation on a public-private board. And for business, there will be different levels of investors, so it's just not top investors. It would not be controlled by a handful of top businesses. Small businesses would have an opportunity to participate. So really, all of Pitt County would be involved in a public-private partnership. Um, stakeholder interests. Um, sometimes I am asked about uh, stakeholder interests, like, for example, will only the businesses that contribute money to this organization be allowed to, do, uh, allowed to bid on contracts for new companies? That's not the case. Um, and since this is a public-private partnership, it would act like a public entity in terms of stakeholder interest. Board would have confidentiality policy, conflict of interest policies, all the best practice policies that you would put into place in an organization to ensure that stakeholder interest was not in conflict with uh, any program of work. And then sometimes I'm asked about fundraising and whether that hurts other organizations, particularly the Chamber of Commerce. It is a best practice when you form these organizations that you do not accept funding from any business that cancels their chamber membership. This is an investment above and beyond an association membership. It's an investment in a, in a different, type of, um, different type of investment than you would make in a chamber of commerce. And I'll be glad to answer any other perceived disadvantages in the uh, question and answer. I handed out two uh, pieces of paper. The first one is a proposed governance model. And I just want to walk you through this as, and this, again, this is a proposed, um, it is in, of course, of early draft form. And we have a transition process that would work through uh, modifying and, and finalizing this uh, governance model. But first, there would be three classes of members. Uh, the sustaining members, as we've called them, would be Pitt County and the City of Greenville. So your investment in this organization would, uh, in essence, fund the basic operations of the organization. You would be the two foundational uh, members of the organization. And after that, municipal members. So any municipality that contributes a per capita amount would be put into a rotation to have a seat on this board three seats at any given time in rotation. It's the uh, dark sheet on the front. There's a governance structure. If you're looking for it, the uh, blue and black sheet has a governance model. On the, um, the municipal members, three seats in rotation. And the city of Greenville will be eliminated from that rotation since they're a sustaining member. So if Aiden, Farmville, and others uh, contributed to this organization, they would be put in a rotation that would have a seat on this board. And even when they're not in the rotation, their local government manager would um, have an ex officio non-voting seat. So they would always be represented even if they don't, were not in the rotation at the time. And then under investors, uh, top investors at a certain amount would have a board seat. Then there's the gold, silver, and bronze levels, which have not been defined yet. But this would allow even the smallest of business to have 
um, to have uh, uh, to be able to be a part of the organization and then through that investor pool they would then elect people to represent that level on the board so we've been uh, asked a lot during this group what is the role of the development commission we recommend that the development commission re uh, remain intact it is a taxing authority you need that structure <coughs> to continue to raise the tax and the funds for economic development. So we, we recommend that it remain um, an organization, a taxing authority, but over time uh, transition that leadership to the county commissioners and then they would allocate funding for operations to the umbrella organization and then they, the remaining funds, the tax funds, would be used for incentives and product development and things that you use that tax money for now. We don't recommend eliminating that because you're unique in Pitt County. Most, uh, or, uh, in fact, I'm hard pressed to think of another county in the state that actually has an authority with taxing power. It's widely used in Virginia. Um, they have uh, taxing authorities for economic development there. We have you know, Juan Cheese Seafood Park is a state taxing authority for economic development. But there, um, there are few, if any, others that are structured just like you in the state. So that taxing authority is important, and those funds are important. Um, but we would recommend that eventually the, the uh, PCDC, the leadership, be transferred to the Board of Commissioners, and then you allocate the operational funding to the umbrella organization, the public-private partnership, and then the remaining funds you just retain for incentives and products and, and what you use that for now. We've included a proposed organizational chart, and the reason we wanted to show this is to ensure that, um, to ensure all staff would be rolled into the organization. But you'll see some proposed future staffing. Um, some of you um, and others in the community took place to a, a, inter, a community visit with Spartanburg, South Carolina to look at their economic development organizational structure. And they have an umbrella organization that also includes the Chamber of Commerce, the Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, includes downtown, uptown types of, uh, uh, type of organization. And we actually put in place a very similar model to this in Lee County in Sanford. Their Committee of 100, their County Economic Development Organization, and the Chamber of Commerce were merged into one organization about I want to say it was maybe three or four years ago. And so there's a model not too far from you for you to investigate. The Spartanburg model is one that was familiar to folks because of their visit there. But we show that as possibly future. I could envision um, down the road where your umbrella organization had a chamber division with chamber activities. It had a convention and visitors bureau division with visitor services. It has an uptown, downtown division with those services. And economic development would be a division and that umbrella, again, that's an even higher level of collaboration. And that would be something that I hope that you would work toward in the future. But an interim step uh, would be this uh, consolidation of efforts between the uh, economic development groups of the county and the city uh, right now. And you can see how we have rolled those together um, just as an example of organization. So how do you get there? Um, <laughs> that's the real question. How do you get there? And we've proposed a five-month uh, transition plan. Um, first, create a transition board. What we have talked about and what's on the paper in front of you is just is a recommendation. It's a draft recommendation. Uh, we need uh, in Pitt County a group of leaders from all the organizations that we've talked about to come together on a transition board and to, um, to work through this process of governance, funding, program of work, um, and all the things that you need to, to work through. We suggest that this transition board include the Development Commission, the Committee of 100, the Greenville Office of Economic Development, the municipalities, and some of the investors that are going to come on early in the fundraising campaign. And we suggest that the Development Commission chair lead this transition board. And again, their work is to uh, work out the fine details, if you will, over the next few months. We suggest that you hire an inter interim CEO. That's just a short-term person that can oversee and help guide this transition. Not intended to be a long-term person, um, but someone, for example, with change management experience would be good to help lead the transition. And then um, next step would be to start co-locating the offices of economic development. That in itself will create a lot of synergies uh, in the program of work and the activities and with staff to co-locate. 
Then start working on merging those programs of work um, that now exist between the city and the county, start merging those programs together. And then by around month five, uh, develop the comprehensive budget, finalize the structure, the strategic plan, the program of work, and then start a search for a permanent CEO. And this whole process would be overseen by the transition board that will come back to you for final approval of an organizational structure. So with that, I'm going to call um, Rick Kiernan back up to the podium with me, and uh, we'll answer all of your questions. I will punt the hard questions to Rick, and I will take the easy questions. <laughs> Do we have a copy of that last um, PowerPoint? Yeah. yeah. We don't. I don't think we, we do. don't have a copy. No, I'm sorry, I did not provide you a copy okay. of the PowerPoint, you. but we can make that available we'll, to you. That would be nice. Yes. Thank you. Yes. We'll get that to you. So questions? We got the five months, but we don't have that other one. Did you, was you going to make another presentation, sir, or you just start for answering? Uh, no, sir. I'm just here to answer any questions you might have. All right. On behalf of the commissioners, I want to thank both of you and all of those in the audience that have participated in this. This concept of private government is really, as you said, germane, but it's not really new to this county. You alluded to back to Barris Welcome many, many years ago when that came, and look what that's done for this community. Of course, there were local involvements in that. So that private government monies mingling is not new, but on this level, I agree that it is. I think it's very interesting and it's something that we can go for. But uh, there will be presentations that have been done here later on, I understand, today and other times to various and different other entities. And at this time, uh, I believe we want to uh, open the, for the board, the initial board, uh, to have input as to what they've heard here this morning. And uh, did you want to say something? Um, I just um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's good to kind of hear. Um, it, together, um, we were all aware as commissioners what were going, what was going on because of the amount of money that we had put in to see this procedure move forward. Um, I think as commissioners, our next step is I really think we need to have a workshop sometime to sit and talk through this and and of course it'll be open to the public. All of our workshops are, but. I think that all of us have a lot of questions, and that's something I'd like to just see us have, um, have happen, uh, Mr. Chairman. We'll go around, and everybody wants to comment, then we'll come back to that. Uh, Mary? Yes, I, I, I want to make a comment. I appreciate the energy in your uh, presentation, but to me, uh, you missed a segment in this county that had not been inclusive in the current economic development. My district has, in my opinion, has been completely left out of the economic development. And my residents have to drive a long ways to get goods and services and workplace than anyone else. For instance, Bethel. Uh, there is a neighboring county called Martin County Economic Development uh, Oak City, uh, I learned that Bethel didn't have a grocery store from an Oak City residence whom I was friends with, and that's where they used to go to shop. Bethel does not have a grocery store, and it is a uh, 10 to 12 mile difference depending on where you leave the city to get there. And it makes their budget reduced by having to drive farther than maybe uh, I know where Melvin lives, uh, where Commissioner McLaughlin would drive to get groceries than, you know, to anyone else. And we like to build our resources rather than thin them out. It is important that an economic development plan for Pitt County be a bit more balanced as far as development is concerned so that we all can enjoy the wealth of the county rather than be a victim or, uh, or maybe penalized because of where we choose to live in the county. Uh, drainage is a problem when you don't have 
drainage is not a problem when you have because when we are told that we cannot develop this land because of drainage and you find that land that was not originally uh, cited for development gets developed. There needs to be more input into this and there need to be a, a very large general perspective from our representation throughout the county because we are representing the entire county on this board. And I'm, I have a lot of concerns and I have a lot of uh, emotional feelings as to what I'm hearing. I appreciate, but I, I think that needs to be encumbered. And I'm sure my district and some of them are very interested in development and, I, and, and they have stakeholders. Uh, feelings about how Pitt County is growing and developing without considering a very large land mass such as the area north of the Tar River. It seems to be a great divide. This board has heard it before and as a new person in, I want you to hear it personally from me because this board knows that I feel very strong about it. And uh, so does, I think, my residents too as well. Thank you very much. and. Um, we don't need to be hurt any longer. Thank we you, Mary. Just don't. Thank you, Mark. If uh, I could just any other input from board members, uh, Mr. Colson? I've got some, a lot of questions like was pre previously mentioned, and I think Beth is right. We probably ought to have a round table to discuss this uh, on this subject alone and dedicate to it. According to the structure you gave us here, it appears as you're recommending 18 voting seats is that correct three of which will come from the county and yet the county is the sustaining uh, supplier of money potentially because of our taxing authority which you admit is unique and that's been one of the things that we were kind of worried about as to how this would go it also has to do with the the positions that i'm sure there will be something at least i assume there'll be something that will deal with the structure of the job or position and their authority as to what they can and can't do because Absolutely. this could, could become a political hammer that uh and and by the i'm going to say the back channel people talking calling them up on the phone and having their own well i got my you know i got my 10 guys that they'll vote for and and whatever you have a number of other seats that's really not quantified as far as uh, local government, uptown, so on and so forth, ex officio um, voting members. So I'm, I'm looking at this board, potentially when it goes into session, you might have 30 or more people. Is that correct? No, all of those uh, ex officio are non-voting seats, and the reason that. they're there is to exchange information and collaborate. For, for the reason that the earlier commissioner was actually, the, the very reason she was talking about, to make sure that everyone that needs to be involved in a public-private economic development organization has the opportunity to be involved in those meetings. They can ask questions. They can participate in discussion. They're just non-voting. But, uh, but back to your earlier point about who directs the program of work of this organization, that will be you and other stakeholders. Um, the best practice for a public-private partnership is for that organization to develop its five-year strategic plan, within that an annual program of work. It brings that program of work to this body and other stakeholders and says, this is what we are going to do with our funding this year. Everyone buys, uh, signs off and endorses that. They do that program of work and they produce an annual report that says we finished that program of work. So at every point along the way, um, this group, your representatives to that board will have input into that strategic plan, input into that program of work, and then you approve that. And so that's what directs the, um, what the organization does in a well, best practice. Well, going back to sustaining members, you've got the city of Greenville who has their own economic efforts and then Pitt County. Of course, we know about Pitt County. Uh, is the city of Greenville going to stay as it is, or are they going to re? Are they going to be changing their? They're, they're this is not the time, really, for me to try to formulate no, the questions. No, I, I do better when I'm thinking on my own and away from here because I write them all down and give them to Scott, and he has an encyclopedia in front of him. But <laughs> that's why we need to do. But I'm concerned. The city of Greenville are they going to be an equal provider of funding? 
Yes, it is my dollar for dollar. It is my understanding that they will be with the county an equal sustaining member, and that their economic development will be rolled into this organization so that there's no duplication. But these 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 details, I love that that you're thinking through all these. This is really what that transition board, as representatives from your board, the city, the the municipalities, other organizations, and that transition board work through these fine details. Uh, we've made recommendations. If you take those board seats. That we've recommended from the county, the city, and municipalities. Um, those votes, I think, total to about nine, and then you have private sector votes on there as well that total to nine, plus some additional maybe top investors. So it's generally weighted 50-50, generally with public-private um, votes on there. But this is the type of detail that that transition board, with all this input, will work through over the next few months. So who creates the bylaws for this? So we would, so for example, we have example bylaws in our organization, like from Lee County, which merged their organizations, like I mentioned. Um, that could be a starting point, taking best practice model uh, bylaws. But the transition board, which again has your representation, would work through a recommended proposed set of bylaws that would then come back to this body and other stakeholders for endorsement. And as far as uh, voting, is it going to be simple majority, or does it have to be? Uh, that could be worked through in the bylaws. You can have a simple majority. You could require certain things, uh, usually a best practice, uh, for, to example, uh, example, to amend the bylaws, a best practice is a supermajority. Okay, yes. so Scott, and, yes. and, uh, and because you had brought it up as a possibility of us having a workshop, would you be available to come back? I, uh, maybe we don't want you back. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean I, I, that came out wrong. <laughs> <laughs> taken but I would I would be glad to make myself available and again uh, because we have helped many organizations um, merge groups and then develop structure modify board structure I'll be and what I have done um, in this process is just to share what is the best practice um, and and give you several options and alternatives for that transition board and your board to talk about I'll be glad to make myself available so does Beth need to make a motion? I would. Or Let, let's go around, Tom. All right. Until we get to these other members that want to talk, and then we'll come back to that. Uh, Melvin, did you want to say anything? Uh, I, I just want to thank you for your presentation. Wanted to know, um, during your uh, interview process that you uh, conducted, I think you say you had about 69, 61 interviews. Uh, how, the, yes, how diverse was was the team and? Uh, how was how was these people chosen uh, in terms of interviewing? Sure. So we went back to the, all the folks who had participated in the roundtable discussions and made sure that even if we did not have representation there, we wanted to make sure that we had representation from all the municipalities. That was very important. And then also going out to the private sector. Uh, not just the large businesses, but smaller businesses, medium-sized businesses. And by the way, in our final report, you're going to get a list in the appendix. You'll see all the participants uh, from the roundtable discussions, as well as those we interviewed. So you'll see a really good cross-sections of, of individuals. It, Finish, Melvin. Thank you. Uh, Ann, did you indicate you wanted to say something? Well, I, I just want to thank you um, for your presentation, and I agree with Commissioner Ward and everybody else that a workshop is needed to kind of hash out some of these uh, uh, proposed uh, ideas or even for the, uh, the alliance, the transition mm -hmm. group, that's what I'm going even to work out that. So that's where I am. Mr. Garish. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much for your presentation, and uh, I can see from the results that you have put a lot of work and a lot of effort in this and has involved the complete community, and I think that is great. I think that everybody in this room is very, very supportive of economic development. The thing that we're trying to figure out is how is the best way to do that as a community. I agree that in the past we have been doing it in kind of a segmented way. We have had one group focusing on industrial economic development and the other groups uh, within the municipalities have been focusing primarily on uh, retail and commercial within their municipality. Uh, is it appropriate to combine both of those as this uh, proposal is recommending? At this point in time, I really don't know. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of work and a lot of discussion and a lot more understanding has to take place before we can make that decision. Uh, and it almost appears to me like in your presentation and in your time frame that uh, you have concluded that we accept the fact that this is the appropriate organizational structure and we're supposed to be uh, developing the specifics as to how that is to work uh, over that five month time frame. But I am more of the nature, I want to know what the end product is before I commit that the end product is the appropriate product. I need to understand what that product is. And right now, I don't fully understand what that product is. For example, I know that uh, this is, this proposal, I believe, is dependent very heavily upon that three cent tax that the Board of Commissioners is, is authorized to enact. Uh, and that gets to be sensitive with the Board of Commissioners. What I am uh, equally interested in is how much of this budget, this two and a half million dollars, two and a half to three, that you believe after your interviews with the private sector that they would be willing to kick in. Now, I know you said three, three out of five said they would be willing to financially contribute. Isn't that what you said? Uh, three out of five, I'm trying to remember what that, that statistic was. It wasn't that they'd be willing to contribute. It was probably that they thought the funding was realistic to raise yeah. 2.75 million? Yeah, so, so see, and that concerns me. I can say, yes, I think that we can raise that money because I'm counting on Mark and Beth and Tom and Mary to contribute. What I'm interested in is the commitment from the stakeholders as to how much money Mark and Beth and Mary and Tom are willing to write a check for. To me, that's, that's, that, is, that is one of the fundamental uh, premises upon which this program would be successful, in my opinion, to have a public-private partnership. What is the private sector going to be willing to contribute? And what is the public sector going to be expected to contribute? And we don't know that yet. So we would be gathering those specifics in that five month time frame, right? I may have explained that incorrectly. So the, the three out of five people believe that it's uh, realistic. We then ask folks, would you invest? Would you contribute yeah. money? And then we talk, so yes or no. And then could you give us a sense of where your financial support might lie on this fundraising chart here? So we had folks, it wasn't just that Three out of five thought it might be realistic, but we had people said, if this goes forward, I would invest X. And, and that would X. Would X? Uh, yes. Yeah, so How it, much did the X add up to? <laughs> it, exact. Great point. So the low end of X was 1855000 The high end was just around $2.4 million, somewhere around there. That, so, that's what they told us they would personally, personally as a company or as a smaller municipality, that's what they thought they would invest in a campaign. Okay, so that included the private sector, the municipalities, and the county? Uh, it did not include Pitt County or the city of Greenville. Okay. So it's the private sector and all the other municipalities. That's why if, we, if they told us they would yeah. contribute between 1850000 and $2.4 million roughly, we think based on our experience also because it was a small sample size or only about 60 or so folks we'd want to go out to a lot more people and, and ask for a lot more business support we think we would raise between 2.5 and 3 million but what they told us was 1,855,000 okay. to 2.4 okay. million okay so one other i question. apologize i miss i That's probably okay. explained that incorrectly one other question so when when in this five month time frame would the decision about 
this structure or a similar structure be expected to be made? When would that decision be made? Would it, it, would it be at the beginning of the, of the five no, month or no. at the end of the five month or at somewhere end, in between? Um, what I would suggest is that transition board at the beginning take the recommendation as well as you know, other best practice models we can pull together for that transitionary group and then to pick through all the details that you've been talking about and what I would hope would happen at the end of that five months is they would say here's the structure we recommend here is the compiled budget we recommend here is the final staffing model we recommend here is uh, here are the MOUs the memorandums of understanding with the county the city with Aiden with Farmville with other organizations um, and bring that together as one body of work for your approval, the city's approval, um, other uh, ally or, uh, organization approval at the end. Now, hopefully somewhere around month three or so, you'll be coalescing around a concept, but um, they should bring that back as, as one package for approval. So then, if, if I'm understanding correctly, we would, you've made this presentation to the Board of Commissioners. I think it's very appropriate that we need a workshop and that then we could come up with our ideas and our concepts. This is, presentation is going to be made to the Development Commission at 12:30. I think that they would need a workshop to come up with their ideas and recommendations. And then I believe at four o'clock it's going to be made to the City of Greenville. They would need to develop input, and even the other municipalities, exactly. they need to do the same thing. And that all, all of that information would be fed into this transition board, and the transition board would take that information plus the information you've developed and start a process to come up with this organizational structure. And then at the end of that, those bodies would then have to say, we agree or disagree with that. Is that correct? The only thing that I would add to that is, remember this is a partnership. Yes. So I would say that when you get together, don't decide this is the way we want it and the way it has to be. Because if you did that, then the city would do that and everyone would do that. What I would suggest is to come up with a list of what's important to us. And everyone, when you come to the table with what's important, this transition board should take all that into consideration. And the people that you appoint to be a part of this transition board should carry those important topics with them for discussion. Um, and that's because it's a, it's a give and take in a public-private private partnership with all the stakeholders. But that, the workshop is a great idea and, and defining what is important to us and who are our representatives to the transition board, who are they going to be. And that transition board would have representatives own it from all of those all of entities, entities, the cities, yes, uh, uh, Greenville, the other municipalities, yes, sir. the county, and the private sector. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Charles. Yes, this has been about talked out, but my main concern is Greenville Utilities, and I have some questions on the extent of their involvement and where are they getting their financing to give money away on an experiment such as proposed. That's all I'm saying at this time. Thank you. Uh, the, the consensus being that... Uh, Can I say one more thing? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I was going to let you, you want, make the motion. Oh, okay. I will make that motion. Thank right. you very much. I didn't mean to interrupt. I didn't know what direction you were going in. I don't want anybody sitting here thinking that the county commissioners in any way are not for this. We definitely are. We have come so far in the last 20 years in development in this county. Actually, the last 21 years. You can go back and look at our record. Um, if you want to talk to some people that are already established here, that we have brought here industries directly related to our development commission, and where we started simply with incentives and where we are now with incentives for industries that we're talking to right now, uh, industries that are seeking us at the present time. We're not against this alliance, but what we want to make sure is that our municipalities, they were not even invited or to hear this until I called on Friday and said, Let's it, tell them to come, send a representative to this meeting, the one that's being done for the municipality of the city of Greenville, 
and the one that's being done, of course, they can't get them in the development uh, planning board room because it's not big enough. But um, that is one of our biggest concerns because this is county development. We have been working hard on it all these years. We plan to continue. We are thrilled to get in these people. But we have got to get our municipalities involved. We've got to get them on this board. Um, I don't know that the amount of money you're going to put in it should be determining the number of votes you have on this board. I, I, I'm not sure that's the right direction to go in. Um, there are small municipalities in this town that our develop, I mean, in this county that our development commission has worked hard for. They have industries presently sitting out there in Aden, in Farmville, in Grifton, in Fountain, all over directly related to the work and the effort of our development commission. So I think this workshop is needed. I'd like to make a motion that we do it as soon as we can because I do not want you and you not to be here when we're discussing this. We Mark. might not want to be here. No, but I want you here. And Jimmy, I want you here right, along with all the Chairman. rest of you. So um, we are absolutely in favor of the alliance, but we feel like Pitt County is really the center of this. Mr. So, Ms. Ward has made a motion as our second. I like the second. All right, and uh, Mayor, you second that motion. Yes, I do. All in favor of that motion, indicate by raising your right hand. Thank you. And on behalf of the board, I want to uh, take a personal privilege and, and thank the private sector who has shown an interest in this over the period of time that's been going on, the overtures that you've made. Also, the presentations that have been presented to here today by the various and different peoples. It is uh, it, it's a movement that is needed in this county. We've got a good economic machine in this county, as you've alluded to. But, you know, you want to enhance that all the time. I think these overtures that's been made here today is certainly an enhancement of that. And we appreciate your presentation. We know you've got two more to do today. But... Uh, and we will have, uh, Scott, you will arrange for yes, the yes, sir. workshop that the board has voted on and let us know about that. And thank you for coming. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank We're you. not going to drag our feet. Good. <laughs> okay. All right. That is good. Oh, thank, thank both of you. Thank you. Um, next order of business, uh, Mr. Elliott. Next, we have an employee recognition. If the board will consider passing a resolution, we can go present it. Do we have a motion for that? All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, so order. Yeah. Um. This morning we have a, an employee recognition for Alma Haddock. If she'll come forward with any um, <coughs> family members, um, co-workers, whoever she has here with her. Is she here? Okay. All right. Ms. Haddock actually retired, was it last month? Uh, June. June, okay, this past <laughs> summer. The um, Pitt County does a resolution for any employee that has 30 years of service or more when they retire. So, Mr. Chairman, if you'd like me to read Please. the prepared, prepared resolution. Resolution honoring Alma Haddock for her years of service with Pitt County government. Whereas Alma Haddock was hired January 11th, 1998, in the position of clerk type is three, with the Department of Social Services, whereas Alma Haddock has faithfully served the citizens of Pitt County for 30 years and six months, whereas Alma Haddock served honestly and with great loyalty and dedication and was re reclassified to Data Entry Operator 2 in June 1994, again to Processing Assistant 4 in June 2000, whereas Alma Haddock was promoted to Income Maintenance Caseworker 1 in August of 2004, and again in 2006 to Income Maintenance Caseworker 2. Whereas, as a caseworker in family and children's Medicaid, Ms. Haddock was responsible for ensuring that pregnant women received Medicaid for doctor's appointments to ensure healthy babies, as well as make sure children had health coverage for medical appointments, medicines, and necessary shots through family and children's Medicaid, including the Health Choice Program. Whereas, Alma Haddock's longstanding work ethic has, has made her a part of the Department of Social Services Foundation and a steady force among her coworkers. 
whereas Alma Haddock retired June 25th, 2018 from the Department of Social Services. Now it be therefore resolved that the Pig County Board of Commissioners does hereby express its gratitude and thanks to Alma Haddock for her career of dedicated and exemplary service to the people of Pitt County and honor her with this resolution. You're making me emotional. <laughs> <laughs> resolution of appreciation giving under our hands in the seal of Pitt County this 10th day of September 2018. Adopted this 10th day of September 2018. Signed by our chairman, Mark W. Owens Jr. and by our clerk, Kimberly W. Hines. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Haddock. Appreciate you. I don't really know what to say. I'm just accepting this um, on behalf of my mom. I don't know if people know she's still in the hospital right now. So um, she's there, and I just want to accept this for her and all her years of service at Pitt County. And I want to thank you all. Thank you for your good work. Mr. Chairman, you want to ask our DSS Director, Jen Elliott, to... Certainly, you know, we at the, the Department of Social Services uh, valued the work that your mom did all these years, and, and we certainly uh, appreciate that and want you to continue to tell her how much we appreciate it. Let her know our thoughts and prayers are with her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, man. All right, let's see. Mr. Manager, do you have anyone signed up for public address to the board? Yes, sir. We have a few people signed up. Um, first person we have is Mark Garner. If you'll come forward, and if the attorney, please. attorney will read our statement on public addresses. Yes, uh, Pitt County welcomes comments on all matters of public concern. Please um, keep your comments to three minutes. I'll keep your time if you'll state your name and address um, for the board. Um, we welcome your comments. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. My name is Mark Garner. I reside at 3289 Brick Kiln Road, Greenville, which is located between Simpson and Grimesland. And I promise you this will be less than three minutes. I appreciate the opportunity to sit in the audience today and listen to the presentation that you have just had made to you. Uh, I come to you not only as a citizen all of my life of Pitt County, but also as a prior member for six years of the Development Commission Board for Pitt County, two years having served as chair and two years having served as vice chair prior to that. I would just like to say to you as a board, uh, number one, I have full confidence in what you will do in any case, in any regard, and I thank you for your service. In economic development in Pitt County, industrial development some call, uh, I think we have had many successes working together uh, with the various, as we say, fractionalized entities that exist in the county. It's been a good collaboration, uh, but I think we need to figure out in 2018 how we can do more uh, to work better together. And what does that look like? I like most of what I've heard this morning, but of course this is the very first time and I've got the 20 slides and that was it. Um, I hope that at some point I'll have an opportunity to take a deeper dive into the information that you will receive as well, just from my interest, uh, from a historical perspective of how I've been involved with the county. What pieces of it might work here and what does that really look like? I'm very thankful that you voted to have a workshop to do exactly that dive into it, understand what all those pieces are, what those components are, what they may look like. Uh, the details are yet to be uh, decided, yet to be discussed, yet to be talked about by all the entities that should be involved as you have described. I do know one thing. In the climate that we exist in, we're not just in eastern North Carolina anymore. We're not just in the state of North Carolina. We're not just in the southeastern United States or the United States of America. We're in a global economy, and as a result, we cannot be static. We cannot rest on the laurels of the good things that we have done in all the years past, although they have been very well. Um, I was privileged to serve as a, in a time coming out of the recession on the Development Commission when it was quite a struggle, and we had some good things that happened during that period here in Pitt County, but we need to continue to look forward. I'm not standing before you today to say I support 100 percent everything that you've heard so far today. I'm saying it warrants a good, strong discussion and strong consideration. Please be open-minded. 
give the details a chance to be discussed and worked out, whatever that might look like, and continue to work for the best of all of Pitt County, as I know you will. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Mark, for your presentation and for your good service. Next, okay, next we have Kayla Collins. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Kayla Collins, and I reside at 1703 Canterbury Road in Greenville. Um, I am excited to be here this morning, and thank you all for having us. Um, I am the Development Director for NC Medicist, and I'm here just to bring awareness to what we're doing in Pitt County. So NC Medicist is a statewide nonprofit free pharmacy program. We help those individuals who are low income and uninsured get their prescription medications at absolutely no cost to them. We want to completely eliminate the the battle that some people have between purchasing their food for their family and the needs for their family and getting their life-saving pr prescriptions. So we want to eliminate that that constant battle for these families. Um, Currently, right now, in the past six months, NC Medicist has filled 1,412 prescriptions through our free pharmacy program in Pitt County. Um, in the past two years, we have served 1,267 individuals in Pitt County through our mobile free pharmacy program. That program is where we bring in over-the-counter medications and we open it up to the public. And these um, people in our in our county are able to come to this event and get up to eight over-the-counter items to stock their medicine cabinets. Um, so I just wanted to bring this to your awareness. Our office is located in Charlotte, but obviously we serve the entire state of North Carolina. I am actually local here in Greenville as we are trying to really uh, develop this area, get more supporters, make people aware of what we're doing in this area, and also raise awareness. Um, so if any of you guys are interested in opening doors for us in this area, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, but I just wanted to make you guys aware of what all we're doing in our county and for our residents. I do have handouts. Am I allowed to give those? Is that okay? So then you guys can read up um, on information because it is a very... Um, large program and I just want you guys to be aware of what's going on so thank you again for your time thank you for your service thank you, thank you for your hand All right, next next we have Mike Waldrum <coughs> good morning commissioners good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to make a few comments um, my name is Mike Waldrum 721 Chesapeake Place Greenville North Carolina and um, I really enjoyed the presentation and the information that was presented here this morning. It's the first time that I've seen it, but had input into the study and wanted to uh, make a few comments. Um, I think the great news is that um, what I love about Eastern North Carolina and about Greenville is we have common goals and objectives. And the question isn't um, those, but it's how do we get there and be successful for our communities. And I think that uh, what was just said um, is important uh, because I totally agree the game has changed and it is a global market uh, and how we present ourselves in that market becomes the key to our su success and my view is that that key is through collaboration and working together as Eastern North Carolina and as communities in Pitt County. I respect and appreciate the, the conversation and the need uh, for clarity and, and um, I too can't endorse everything that I heard because I just heard it this morning. Uh, but I wanted to give a few comments having been involved in economic development activities in my history before I came to Greenville and here and I thought they were pertinent. And I think some of you may be wondering why does the CEO of Viden Health care about economic development? Um, and our mission is to improve the health and well-being of Eastern North Carolina. And there are really two very important pillars of doing that that are outside of traditional healthcare delivery. And that's educating all of our population and giving hope and economic development for all of our population. And those actually contribute more to health and wellness than the actual delivery part. And so I spent a lot of my time in economic development and promoting uh, education and economic development for our communities. And I think it's important um, uh, that, that we all engage into these conversations. Um, I, I would say that uh, economic development is a race. 
And what we've heard this morning from consultants and people that have been outside of Greenville uh, is what my experience is before coming here, is that every community, every county is trying to figure out how to win that race. And they're asking themselves these questions. And I would say being uh, involved in economic development in other counties and communities that have public-private partnerships that I totally endorse um, what I heard about the, the um, perceived perceptions of disadvantage, that the county and the local government still have controls and capabilities to influence economic development for the benefit of their communities. Um, but the most important thing that I have found here, actually being active and going to visiting companies to try to recruit them to our communities, as well as prior um, involvement in economic development um, outside of our region, although I am involved in a few um, groups here also, is that the consistency of how we're perceived in that market is the most important thing. That if a company sees confusion or sees us as different, buying for, for, for different um, constituents, that they automatically go to the place where they don't see that confusion. I appreciate the opportunity to make comments. Um, I'm happy to work uh, in, in um, supporting these uh, discussions and anything I can do. Um, please don't hesitate to contact me, and I appreciate y'all's uh, concern and deliberation. Thank you. Doc, wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh, uh, we want to thank you taking from your busy schedule, but if you, you can go ahead and continue if you hadn't finished your remarks, although we go by a time schedule. You no, know, I, I think I hit the the big the big the big things. I think that just, you know, I I think folks that have gone to Spartanburg and Greenville, and I was on uh, the Tucson Re Regional Economic Organization, and we went through some of these changes there, and um, it it really was important on how we were perceived in the market, and I'll say that you know I think we we talked about some of the hurdles we have to come over. Um, you know, we don't have an interstate that comes into Greenville uh, yet. We have to play a game that's maybe even more um, uh, up to snuff compared to some of the co communities that have been mentioned in this room this morning. Um, that's our nature in eastern North Carolina. Um, our nature is to overcome adversity and persevere uh, and actually to collaborate and come together as communities. So I think if we build on those strengths um, and we understand what the market needs from us, and we match that, um, we can be successful because we have a great community and a lot to offer. You honor us by your presence, yes, and sir. we gives us an opportunity to thank you for all that you contributed and give to us in, in our community and the total state of North Carolina. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, sir. All right, next. Next, we have items report. The first item is the introduction of PCC's new president, Dr. Lawrence Rouse. And I think um, Rick Owens, are you going to help make this introduction? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Rouse, can if you would like to come forward? You can. Just wanted to bring Dr. Rouse by. It's been, I guess, forty-one days. Forty-one. Yes. Forty-one days 41. that he's been with the college. He keeps coming back. So I guess we're doing something right. Um, from my perspective, he's been a pleasure to work with. I think he's going to continue to do some great things with the college and with that. Certainly. First of all, I want to say to the uh, chairman and also to the board of commissioners, thank you for your support of Pitt Community College. And I know from uh, looking back at some of the things that you have done to support the college, it's evident that this board was very supportive of that institution and had not have been for your support. Pitt Community College would not be where it is today. I'd also like to thank my predecessor, Dr. Dennis Massey, who is a friend and colleague, for his uh, leadership of Pitt Community College doing very expansive growth of buildings as well as the student body. And I'm honored to be the next or the fifth president of Pitt Community College and hopefully we'll build upon the steady rock that's already there that will continue to work with workforce development as far as working with the public schools and the universities here, and that will continue to uh, help those students who are looking for empowerment through education. Again, thank you for allowing me to, to uh, come and be introduced today, and I'm sure at some point I'll have a, a report, but I will entertain any questions that you might have about me. Dr. Rouse, we want to, again, many times you've been welcome since you've been here in these days that was alluded to, but. Uh, 
we in Pitt County and surrounding counties are very fortunate to have you to come and lead our Pitt Community College. And I'm sure that the sky's the limit and you will reach those goals. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Anything else? Uh, um, next, we have a report from Dr. Ethan Linker with Pitt County Schools. Come around, Doc. Good morning. I have a presentation here, I think. Yes, if our PIO office can come out and help um, Dr. Linker. I used to be a technology director, but that was a long time ago, <laughs> so uh, I'll take any help I can get. Um, Chairman Owen, Owens, uh, commissioners, uh, Mr. Elliott, I would say that I've had the privilege of working with um, and, 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 and meeting with uh, Dr. Rouse years ago, back when I was in Sampson and he was in Duplin. So we uh, uh, worked on some early college information way back then. So we're certainly glad to have uh, him here in uh, Pitt County with us. Just a couple pieces of information. This slide you've seen probably for five years or so. So I'm going to go into a whole lot of detail. Not a whole lot has changed that we've added schools in the last couple of years. You see the early colleges there. One of the things that we've been aggressively going after um, uh, is just quality teachers. Obviously, the, the quality teachers and quality principals make the biggest difference in the world um, in, in our schools. And one of the things that we've been able to do is get some diversity in our, in our uh, teachers by going after um, and, and using the different organizations. One Teach for America has been a great organization, one that I've been involved with for uh, seven or eight years now, plus visiting international faculty as, long as, as well as global teaching partners uh, who bring in numerous um, uh, teachers who have actually have lots of experience but are coming here to Pitt County uh, to teach with us, coming from around the world. Um, have a young lady from the Philippines who's teaching exceptional children over at Pactolis. We have a, a math teacher at Farmville High School from Kenya, I think. Uh, so we got teachers from all over. I know we have some, uh, uh, several ladies from Jamaica who are at Aiden Middle and, and Falkland, uh, Northwest, teaching in our schools. Um, probably have about uh, 20 total. Dr. Dr. Council, you over there? Yes. Yeah. 20? Okay, very good. So we're going out of our way to get quality people. And what we find out is, is these are mature teachers who will be staying with us, you know, for probably five years or so. And granted, we wish they would stay longer, but five years is the, almost the, the traditional trend of a teacher these days, unfortunately. So we're hoping to, to, uh, that some of these teachers will actually maybe even stay with us. Uh, the international teachers are actually bringing their children and their spouses with them and coming and being part of our community. couple of pieces of information there. Um, our graduation rate for this past year that just ended is 87 or 84.7. It's actually down about a percentage point from last year, but we're right at the state average. The graduating class of last year had about uh, $33 million in scholarship opportunities. Um, we had 27 over 34 schools meet or exceed growth. Of course, I can look at that and realize that means seven didn't. So we have some work to do, obviously. Um, our grade level proficiency continues to climb slowly, but it continues to climb. Some uh, stuff that's always good to share is the uh, our relationship that we have with Pitt Community College. They, they have gone, but I would say that our number of students over the last several years who are taking CTE credentials, you can see that number. Uh, we don't have 17-18 data yet, but you can see from two years ago we had uh, almost 3,300 students getting uh, CTE credentials. This past year, we have the fall and the, and the spring broken out. You see, um, what is that, 11,000 or 1,137 uh, classes by our students. Uh, that was in the, in the fall, over 3,400 college credits, and then even a little bit higher than that in the spring. This past year, we, I know we had a lot of conversations over SROs. Uh, we did apply for the state grant. We received almost half a million dollars from the state this year and half a million, almost half a million for next year. Uh, we are funding the other half of that. Uh, we are adding um, 10 or 11 SROs. If we, can, if we have 11 quality people, we will hire 11 uh, individuals. So we'll be having 11 new SROs, and that's between Grifton, Aiden, Winterville, Greenville PD, Farmville PD, and the Sheriff's Department. So we're using all of our local municipalities and our Sheriff's Department to fund those positions. 
And then also late in the spring, uh, using some federal dollars, we were able to hire additional school uh, social workers. And those are really school social workers that are really looking at, um, we'll talk about a program called ACEs later, but really working with some severe uh, situations and, and families and where we are, you know, within the school system. And so those are assigned to specific schools based on attendance and things that the schools need. Um, a couple things that are kind of interesting and kind of fun. Um, we started some restart schools this year. We'll have another one coming on board next year. That's called Grifton. Uh, but in the first, what we're doing with Northwest and Falkland is, is we're adding coding and robotics to our elementary schools, where these students aren't just going to learn, you know, there's North Carolina Standard Course of Study. We're teaching them through, through coding and through robotics. So when these students, you know, they, they can actually take this information and actually apply it to something as they're learning. And that really gets them involved in their learning, makes student engagement even at a higher rate. Um, our open enrollment piece, as you can see there, over the last uh, two years, we've increased uh, our, our students and our families who are participating in open enrollment. That's been a very popular, um, over the last four or five years, uh, popular with our, with our families and our communities in Pitt County. This slide you have seen before, just to kind of remind you that, but if you look at Belvoir, we have added the global piece this year. We do expect next year to add the global piece to Pactolus, and then the year after that, adding dual language to Pactolus as well. So we'll be expanding those programs. Very high expenditure. The community Im uh, and economic impact is something that I uh, shared with you a year ago about the, uh, we received that R3 grant, which was the federal TIF grant, the TIF grant, which gave us about $16 million plus money from the state, another $6 million. So overall, about $22 million uh, in addition to helping us with, uh, with all these sort of things. It also is the reason we're not struggling uh, with our class size ratios right now. We'll, I'll mention that here briefly as well. But you can see this year we're scheduled to get uh, $6.3 million. That'll go to our teachers and our, uh, the, the department that's running this. But you can see we have 83 teachers receiving a 15% supplement, 270 teachers getting an extra $1,200. We're actually going to try to raise that if we can. Uh, 15, what we call our MCTs, which are our multi-classroom teachers. This is where a teacher is, is actually responsible for teaching, like it says, multiple classrooms. They don't just have their own 20, 20 22 kids. Th those, those teachers are being responsible for teaching multiple classrooms and working with multiple teachers. So, and those teachers obviously are the best of the best. So we'll get that influence over more classrooms and more students. And then, of course, the 34 co-teachers are working with those uh, multi-classroom teachers. And this will continue for another three, three more years. The exciting, uh, over the past summer, we had the, uh, the uh, with Pitt, uh, uh, Pitt Community College. You can see at the top of the uh, new building for our early college. We had that ribbon cutting at the beginning of our second or so day of school for those, for those students. So that was the first week of August. And then we had the ribbon cutting a couple days later, or maybe the week before, for the new Innovation Early College High School with ECU. That, uh, that early college obviously has been in, been in the works for probably 10 or 12 years, maybe even longer than that. So we're excited to, uh, to have that program going. Um, we have 55 students at ECU who will be taking college classes as well as their traditional high school classes. And right now at... Um, at the, our first early college high school, we have 300 students who are over there taking uh, college and high school classes as well. <clears throat> we had two schools in this last year who, got, um, who were recognized uh, nationally for their work they've done within the buildings. One of them was Stokes, uh, St Stokes School. They were a uh, leader in me school, and they were recognized as a lighthouse school, which is something that only about 10% uh, of the schools that are leader, leader in me schools get to, and only, I think they said there was nine in the state of North Carolina. Um, so we're certainly proud of Stokes School and what they've done. And then Ridgewood Elementary was a national school of character. They, uh, we actually just re uh, were uh, recognized by the State Board of Education last Thursday for their work. And that's actually a, a there's two schools in the state of North Carolina who got that recognition, and that's actually a national model. They're actually getting visits from all over the country and all over the state to look at what they're doing at Ridgewood Elementary. And they're doing some great things. Um, 
This is part of our student services department. Some of the things we're looking at is we've been focusing on our, our suspension rates uh, for years. We have now uh, partnered with restorative justice practices and we've been working with EBA COC to do some things um, within our community to help with our suspension rates. Plus we're working with our PBIS, our positive behavior intervention support program, which actually is basically like catch a kid being good. You wanna, you wanna promote that kids doing the right things and being positive. So that's what we do for those students. We, um, we, we try to promote the positive behavior within schools. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then we are continuing to work with, um, with Building Hope as a way of, uh, this is like our fourth year, partnering with Building Hope as a way to combat short-term suspensions so these students have a place to go. We are trying to figure out how we can even supply transportation to some of these, to, to this, so there's no excuses for the students not to be there. We're really trying to expand that, that program as well. I would like to go back to just the, our partnership with uh, Pitt Community College when we were talking about the college classes. One of the things we have started this year was we're actually running buses now from two of our high schools to see if we can work this out with Pitt Community College. So where every kid who's at a, one of our high schools, if they want to take a class at the community college, you don't have to worry about your own transportation. We're giving it to them so they can get there and take these college classes. So we're taking away that, that piece, making the, the equity piece this year at South Central and Aiden Grifton. Once we get all the timing worked out, we're going to expand that to all of our high schools. So our students, doesn't matter where you go to school, if you need to take a class at the community college, you'll be able to do it. And we're working on them with timing of classes. So, okay, for example, if you can't teach a calculus class from 10 to 12, because that, like, screws up three classes, right? So you've got to teach these classes so our kids can actually show up there at 8 to 9, and then 9 to 10, and 10 to 11 and get back. But uh, I wish they were still here. But Pitt Community College has been amazing to work with and making these sort of things happen. Um, but that's just one example of how we're even expanding more of these opportunities for our students. After, um, after the tragedy in Parkland, Florida, one of the things we started looking at uh, was our, 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 the trauma that our students are, are facing. So we, I think most people by now have seen the video ACEs and the trauma-informed practices. So we started that practice when, uh, when uh, Dr. Travis Lewis was still with us. He started working with that. And what you'll notice uh, is we've working with our local, um, with Trillium, uh, AHEC, and ECU, and others to train uh, our people. And one of the things that we have, we have now had all of our counselors have been trained beginning of this school year on the adverse childhood experiences. And then we've gone through training for what, the, what these students sometimes are, are, are working with and what they're associated with and just dealing with the, the, uh, the trauma in, uh, that these students have to face on a daily, ba daily basis. There's a great book if you want to read a little bit about it, pretty easy read, um, which is good for me, it's an easy read. Um, they called, that was a joke, but no one laughed. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, okay. <laughs> You've had a long morning, I can tell. Um, but a really good book called The Deepest Well about uh, the, 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 the trauma that some of our kids face on a daily basis. If you remember, uh, we started working on our, um, our access control corridors, our entryways, and you remember this board uh, uh, gave us the money up front back in May uh, to get started on that. So you can see there, those are our six traditional high schools. And I'm just going to show you a couple quick pictures of those schools. Um, North Pitt, you can see the doors there. Um, you're from inside the building, so that's kind of from the main hallway where the students are looking uh, onto the doors there, and you can kind of see where we are. The doors are installed. <coughs> Um, the access control work is next, so they'll actually be functioning, uh, Matt, a week or two? A week or two. A week or two, they'll actually be functioning. We have added, added um, our swiper cards to these doors as well, so you'll actually have to, you'll still have a, a buzzer system and access to get in, and then the, uh, the um, uh, secretary at the school then will be able to buzz you through the rest of the way where you need to go after checking you in. Um, let me take the next picture, there's uh, D.H. Conley. But from the inside of the door, so this is like the area where the students would, would enter or anybody would enter during the day. And you can see a little small picture there of the, uh, the window, which is our, um, our attendance window. This is at Farmville Central. You can see the attendance window there, again, from the hallway, inside the, uh, not inside the building, but looking <coughs> into the hallway. Aiden Grifton, basically the same design as Farmville. J.H. Rose, 
Uh, obviously, some of these buildings were never designed for this sort of thing, so we actually had to be very creative because some of our buildings are obviously uh, older than, than uh, the last uh, 15 or 20 years when these buildings were designed for this sort of approach. But you can see the, uh, the doors, door entryway there's for J.H. Rose. And lastly, uh, South Central just looks like it's a natural fit. The, the doors just fit there at South Central perfectly. It looks like they've always been there, um, except for the ladder sitting there in the way right now, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, some more uh, where we're going next is uh, looking at Aiden Elementary, Elmhurst, and Walcoats. These are, are some of our open campus, our elementary schools. This is where we're working on now. Uh, if you've been to any of the, these schools, you, you realize none of these schools were designed for what we're trying to do, the safety measures we're trying to put in. Um, Walcoats, Elmhurst are multiple buildings. I think Walcoats is five different buildings, so we're looking at lots of things we're going to have to work on over there. But at this point, we do have the new entryway, the new uh, doorway in place. The entryway quarters will be coming in later. But we are adding swiper cards. I, I, I know I've seen the one at uh, Walcoats is there already. Transportation complex, you remember two years ago or so, we started um, um, working on within the community of building, of getting out of our transportation, our bus garage and moving to a new place. This is what it looks like. You can see the, uh, the bus garage there. The building next to it is the storage building that we bought before the bus garage. Um, but you can see, um, looks like we've got four big bays there. They are pull-through bays, so you can actually drive through the other side and come out, so you can actually get eight buses in there um, at a time. And that is actually, we are actually fueling our buses there now, so it's, it's almost complete. We'll be moving things over um, uh, over the next month or so. We, part of our contract was to be out before December. Uh, out of the old bus garage, we will easily be out by December. Uh, but we will be uh, using that transportation complex here for everything in the next uh, month or so. There's the uh, inside of it. You remember these things were paid for with, with some of the LOBS money that we had in place uh, a couple years ago. Belvoir restrooms, I think this might be one of the last projects on our original LOBS uh, grant. Um, and if you remember, I think Mr. Johnson, Matt Johnson has shared with you that we've run into uh, financial costs and everything else with this program. Plus, I think they found a, a wall that wasn't, wasn't supposed to be there or a, uh, a load-bearing wall that we didn't think was load-bearing at the time. So that changed the process a little bit. But you can see we're actually moving along now, taking a little bit longer than we, we thought, but it's coming forward. Um, the installation should be uh, happening over the next month or so. There's our budget. This is a slide we share with you about every year. Um, you can see the, the, the blue line is the top 50, although Pitt County is in the top 50 now, if I remember right. We're number 49 again. We, I think we slipped out for a year when we're back now in the top 50. Thank you for that. Uh, the state average and where Pitt County is as a whole as far as uh, per people funding. A couple quick things. If you remember the K-3 class size we talked about, um, uh, we are still exempt from that. We will be exempt for a couple more years. Mr. Elliott and I have had conversations that when I think we have the capital conversations around December, January, at that point we'll be able to share with you what we anticipate being classroom space problems in the next uh, couple years. Uh, Pitt County Schools is also having a, de having a demographic study done. Um, so we'll have some more information on where we expect to see all the growth that, we're, uh, that looks like is coming to Pitt County, which is kind of exciting. Um, we have uh, we did receive some extra teachers from the state this past year as part of the K-3 class size. Um, uh, but due to some funding levels, we actually transferred local locally paid positions to the state. We again want to keep talking about our our supplements as a, as one of our focuses. And before I, I close, I want to look at two or three things and then introduce some people. Um, I know I had a couple questions. Um, that were some, somebody asked a question about Title I funds, I believe, just a quick, that was in the newspaper. Um, just Title I fun, funds fluctuate several hundred thousand dollars every year. Um, actually, two years ago, we actually got over a million dollars in Title I funds that we were, when we were expecting to lose, lose money. So technically, at this point, we're actually still have the, the more money now than we did two years ago. So we're actually, Title I funds, is that, the schools are getting more money now, even this year, than they were two years ago. So... Um, but Title I fl funds fluctuate, you know, a couple of percentage points every year. Now, just when, 
I don't know if you're dealing with the federal government, which I, I know you are, like Mr. Elliott, you know that's, that's just something you, you learn to expect and, and work with. Um, somebody asked a question about buses going to boys and girls clubs. We transfer about 400 kids to boys and girls club every day. I'm not sure what the question was. I don't know if anybody had a specific question there. Um, um, and I know we have addressed the stop arm cameras, but we're kind of been watching um, where Wake County is with theirs. I know they put it out to bid. We're seeing what that looks like and where we are in that process. That's kind of where we are looking at that sort of thing. Um, so in the Boys and Girls Club, I think the question was, has, had, has that been discontinued dropping them off? No. Okay. No. The Title I funding, I think the question was about Lake Forest Elementary School, possibly the amount. The amount. They, they may have dropped a little bit, but they're higher than where they would have been a couple of years ago. Okay. The other two schools in the paper. Is, is there a way we can get a report, I guess, on per school? What time? Yeah, we have that money. Sure, I'll share okay. it with you. We just gave it to our board um, last week. And the whole concept on the school bus cameras, these are, are we've had a private um, company come <laughs> in proposing to the, to the school system in the county that we outfit the outside of the school buses with cameras so that when a, a school bus stops, the arm goes out. And there'd be a camera on that, so if somebody were to right. illegally pass that school bus, a picture's taken. It's basically a, a ticketing, kind of like the red light camera system, um, was what the proposal came forward. Correct. And we're waiting to, to see. I know a couple school systems, I think um, Wake may be out there with the bids already. We're trying to see what the bids look like um, and then run those numbers back towards us. Could I introduce some people? Would, would the yeah. school system get that money? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, it would all, what, because of the way the law was written, if you remember Governor Cooper came here about two years ago and actually announced that law <laughs> at Lake Forest Elementary School, but the way that law is written, not all the money has to go to the school system. It, the, the people who install the cameras can get up to a certain percentage, and I think that would be, I've seen the numbers as high as 70%. So we're looking to see what it looks like. So we just, that's why we haven't jumped on board yet. Uh, still trying to get a good understanding of how the law is going to be uh, implemented. Mr. Uh, Chairman Owens, can I introduce uh, some of my board here? Yep, so. I've got our, our chair, Ms. Mildred Council, our, our vice chair, Anna Barrett-Smith. We have three board members, Melinda Favendis, Betsy Flanagan, and Robert Moore. I would like to say I appreciate their support for being here today. Um, if you, I think the last three or four times i presented, this board has been here uh, every time, and I certainly appreciate them being here. We also have um, her last official meeting with Pitt County Schools in front of the county commissioners, Ms. Cheryl Olmstead. She's retiring, so she'll become a normal <laughs> citizen, and she's happy, and Don't she's be telling so us. Happy. So, <laughs> she got smiles really uh, way out here, and she's telling telling everybody what they didn't want to hear anyway. She, you know, she's telling everybody what what they really need to know. Um, now, tasting, taking Cheryl Olmstead's place as our new assistant superintendent for curriculum is Steve Lassiter. Mr. Steve Lassiter, he is joining us. Mr. Lassiter was the principal at Pactolis for several years, and you may remember two years ago, three years ago now, he was the uh, North Carolina Principal of the Year. An amazing individual, certainly thrilled to have him here in Pitt County as one on our senior leadership team. We also have with us Dr. Felicity Council. You remember her? Deborah Baggett. Um, and uh, as we remember, Travis Lewis, you, he's uh, been here with us lots of times, but he is now working back at East Carolina University and taking our, with our PIO position is Ms. Jennifer Johnson. So we're glad to have her on board. Yeah, I got everybody. Matt, 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 I? Oh, where, where's Matt? Oh, there he is. He's buddy in. He's, back. he's sitting there watching all the uh, Hurricane Florence information. That's all he's worried about right now. Is uh, <laughs> It's obviously taking a lot of conversation on, on our place is Hurricane Florence and where we are. So with that, uh, I'll answer any questions I could. Uh, Dr. Chairman. Lincoln, thank you for your presentation, and uh, it's always good to have. Oh, I got Ron Butler, athletic director, back here as well. He's also in charge of the community schools uh, for us. So we're certainly glad to see him there as well. These people sneak in or don't even tell me they're coming. So <laughs> That's good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate yes. you and all your people being here. Anybody thank have you. any questions? Thank you, Mary. Have a good thank day, Doc. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Mr. Manager. All right, next is the county manager's report. First item is your next meeting dates, month of October. Um, will be a regular meeting schedule, first and third Monday, October 1st, and then October 15th at 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. respectfully. Um, item B on the list regarding regards the um, group picture for the North Carolina Supreme Court session here in Pitt County. Um, we have those who are registered for the group picture will be 
um, actually on Monday, October 1st, the day before the actual hearings take place the following day. That's at 3.45 p.m. in courtroom number two, the old Superior Court room. I believe the clerk has communicated to those board members who have been um, registered for that event. Also, for the actual event the next day, for the, the two sessions of the North Carolina Supreme Court being held here in Pitt County, there's a 9.30 and 11 o'clock session. I believe the clerk also has reached out to the board regarding that. I heard from um, Senior Resident Superior Court Judge Marvin Blunt um, Friday called me and was urging the any county commissioners and county staff that um, wanted to attend one of those two sessions we need to get that registration in as soon as possible. So if the clerk can work on that or see me, we'll, we'll um, coordinate that further. Um, item C on my list of items, Community Schools and Recreation Advisory Council. The Advisory Council has been in place for, for many years and has done very good work regarding um, the, the recommendations and um, work for the Community Schools and Recreation Program. In the last year or two, um, have been talking to um, internally with staff and um, board members and Dr. Linker about m formalizing that more and transitioning it more to an appointed board um, rather than right now it's just if you um, want to be on the, the advisory council you contact community schools and recreation and if there's available spot you're just kind of you you're absorbed into the council um, would like to bring back to both um, the board of commissioners and board of education a formulation of, an, of a formal appointed board because the Communities and Schools Recreation Program is a joint program between Pitt County Government and the Board of Education, a very unique program here in Pitt County compared to how it's done elsewhere in the state, and allow them to have um, elevate that board so they can make recommendations, whether regarding programs, funding, so on and so forth, that will help us as we move that program forward into the future. So if the board is in agreement to that, we'll, we'll formalize, work with the Communities and Schools Recreation staff and, um, and Dr. Linker and, and bring something back in the future, near very near future. I um, have a couple of other items, um, two hurricane items to report on. The first one regards a hurricane from 24 months ago called Hurricane Matthew, which is um, kind of ironic that we would be reporting on that today. But the state has notified us that um, you've probably seen the advertisements in the paper regarding um, anybody who, who received damage by Hurricane Matthew, they can apply for um, repayments, rebuilds, and repairs. And you can basically call the, two, the 211 hotline um, number, just dial that on your phone, and you'll go to a um, central um, hotline number in Raleigh. They can set you up for um, appointments. You can also go to the www.rebuildnc.gov website. Also here in Pitt County on, um, looks like through September 10th through 12th, there will be um, appointments being taken, and this will be, take place at the Carver branch, or, branch of the Shepherd Memorial Library. And um, this will be a three-day mobile event, outreach specifically to Greenville to help Hurricane Matthew survivors um, to apply for aid. Uh, before um, people in Greenville and the surrounding area who suffered damage to their homes and, and such. So that will, event will take place Monday and Tuesday from 10 to 5 p.m on the 10th and 11th of September, then on the 12th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And encourage anybody who received damage from that. And it's, uh, it's very ironic that we would, we were just given notification, notification of this. And it's ironic that as we now prepare for Hurricane Florence, um, as we all see that impending storm headed our way, I've asked um, if Alan Everett would come forward real quick and just give us a quick report. We've already taken some preemptive planning and actions and continue to, to plan as we um, get ready for the storm as it barrels down toward our way. Okay, I'll be brief. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. Obviously, all eyes are on the Atlantic. Uh, everyone is watching um, Hurricane Florence uh, make its way across the Atlantic. Of course, as you know, in addition to Florence, we also have two other hurricanes that have formed out there, Isaac and Helene. So we're uh, truly watching three hurricanes as we speak, but the one that's, uh, that's, that's most impacting to us at the moment uh, is going to be um, Hurricane Florence. So I was going to tell you that as of 7 o'clock this morning, Florence was a Category 2 storm with uh, winds of 105 miles per hour, but I can now tell you, breaking news, it's now a Category 3 storm with winds of 115 miles an hour. Now that's expected. This storm is expected to continue to intensify. It's actually expected to uh, reach Category 4 status uh, prior to making landfall with 140 mile per hour winds. Uh, landfall is expected to be somewhere between Charleston, South Carolina, and Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, that seems to be the area that the models are, are starting to agree on, that somewhere in that area um, is where that uh, uh, landfall is expected. Now, 
Landfall is expected to be Thursday night into Friday morning. So with that, for us here locally, uh, we could begin to experience tropical force winds as early as Thursday morning. So we're talking, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 mile per hour winds that we could begin to encounter on Thursday. With that, we're currently anticipating um, 8 to 10 inches of rainfall. Other areas are expecting 15 to 20 inches of rainfall. But I will caution you that the forecasters are saying this storm will stall once it reaches land. And the area that it stalls over could produce more rainfall. Um, we hope not, but that's what all the models are indicating. It's always important to remember that um, we should always approach with caution because these storms will change direction. You know, any little bit of wobble in the storm will change the potential movement, uh, will change the characteristics of the storm, as well as maybe where landfall could be. So we continue to watch that uh, with every passing moment uh, regarding the, the current track and the forecast. Um, so that's a, real quick in terms of what uh, Florence is looking like this morning. But um, as Scott alluded to, um, some, some things that we've been working on um, as it relates to preparing our county for potential impact from Florence. I wanted to give you just a, a real brief summary of the activities and some of the steps that we've taken as a county s since last Thursday. We actually started preparing for this event last Thursday. I'm very proud of our county staff for the initiative of, of going ahead and getting an early start on um, some of our preparations. So um, last Thursday, we pushed out our first storm-related uh, communications to all of our partners. Uh, we wanted to put everyone on notice that this thing, this storm was out there and it had potential from what we were seeing from early intelligence. Um, and through the weekend, we continued to disseminate information to our partners. And when I say partners, let me just list a few of our partners so you'll understand who we're reaching out to. We're reaching out to all the municipalities. That's the town leaders of those communities, as well as the law enforcement police chief of those communities. We're reaching out to the fire and EMS communities. Uh, we're reaching out uh, to North Carolina Emergency Management. Also, through our school system, Matt Johnson's a, a, a big partner of ours, uh, an important part of, of our plan. So uh, we communicate with the schools. We communicate with the county department heads and staff throughout the different departments. Agencies like the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, uh, organizations such as United Way, Red Cross, Salvation Army, Biden Hospital, DOT, ECU, GUC, the list goes on in the number of agencies that we reach out to that we consider to be our partner agencies with any type of, uh, of uh, emergency. And so anytime we have communications, we always disseminate it to those folks so that they will know what we know within emergency management. Uh, county staff actually started participating with uh, North Carolina Emergency Management and National Weather Service on conference calls. Uh, we were here yesterday um, uh, participating in some of those calls as well. Last Friday, uh, we scheduled a meeting with our um, partner agencies that provide staffing to our EOC downstairs during activations so that we could discuss uh, Hurricane Florence and the operational needs that will be centered around this particular event. Uh, we do plan to open shelters, including uh, animal shelter, uh, again, just like we did with uh, Hurricane Matthew. Uh, we have requested assistance from National Guard as well as Swift Water Rescue teams to be here to help us uh, with any flooding related emergencies um, as, as this thing makes an uh, approach to Eastern North Carolina. Um, our public information officer, Mike Emery, uh, has been providing information to the media and social outlets. And so, you know, with that, um, as you know, we, the county, are the lead agency responsible for emergency management functions. Um, and that includes assisting our municipal partners with various requests that they may have. And we stand ready to assist those folks with any requests that they may have for resources. So when we talk about our public information, you know, in addition to letting our, our partners know that we're here to help them, uh, we also want to make sure that we are making the community aware. The, the message here is to be prepared. We're talking about a Category 4 storm, 140 miles per hour. I'm not a meteorologist. Um, I like history. Um, history shows us that Hurricane Hugo of 1989 had very similar characteristics to the current forecast of, of um, Florence. Again, that's subject to change, so understand that. It's subject to change, but at this moment in time, it's being compared to her <coughs> Hugo. So we want our citizens to be aware, to be prepared, um, because again, we are talking about a major storm that's potentially going to have a direct impact somewhere in eastern North Carolina. Um, the time for ensuring our citizens and their families are prepared is getting less with every passing hour. That's the message that we're passing out um, to the community. Uh, again, our public information office is doing a great job 
of helping us with that. We also are encouraging um, everyone to visit our, our website uh, and go to the Hurricane Florence page to get the uh, latest uh, updated information, as well as um, they will have access to different hurricane preparedness documents that they can use to help their families um, you know, prepare while we still have time. Now, speaking of preparing and speaking of hurricane and characteristics, you know, there's, there's still much unknown, but one thing that we do know is with the storm like this, history has shown us we will have flash flooding that will occur during this event. And the river rainfall will be inland. And it, it may happen at that moment in time. It may happen days or weeks later. So just because the storm initially passes through does not mean that it's over, that we're out of the woods. We still will have water potentially upstream coming down this way, again, depending upon how the storm tracks. So we're aware of that, that not only are we going to get some flooding from the vent as it passes through, but also we're going to have some delayed flooding, if you will, because any water upstream that would need to that would need to pass through this way. So um, again, it's very important that uh, our citizens understand the, the storm. And again, the storm can change, but to please be prepared. Um, I, I need to give a special shout out to our county manager, Scott Elliott, who has been supportive of us um, all weekend. Um, we, we have bugged him and troubled him throughout the weekend as we've worked on our plan. So uh, a, a shout out to, to Scott for being supportive as we worked through our plans uh, the weekend, of course. Uh, we also want to uh, say thank you for your support and appreciation uh, that you've shown us in emergency management and continue to do so as we prepare our community for whatever the event uh, may be. And speaking of that, um, I've, I've got to say honestly, I hope that every citizen truly appreciates and understands the preparedness and dedication that our fire, EMS, 911, and law enforcement communities have invested in our safety and well-being when called upon to help out whatever the crisis may be. Um, unfortunately, this has the potential to be a very dangerous storm and we want everyone to be alert and be prepared. Uh, we have issued um, a state of emergency. Uh, again, this state of emergency is basically just acknowledging that um, impacts from Florence are indeed possible. The um, state of emergency does not have any curfews or any limitations at this time, uh, but we just wanted to go ahead and get on the record with the state of emergency, as many other counties are doing. Uh, it started last week with the governor declaring a state of emergency, and other counties are following suit. Uh, we have done the same thing. So, um, so we're, we're moving forward. Um, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions um, that you may have. I'd like to make a comment. That state of emergency will be effective at 5 p.m. today, Monday, September the 10th. To kind of time stamp as for the public who may be watching this in the days to come throughout the week, today is Monday, September the 10th, and is about 11.20 in the morning. So as the public may be hearing what you just said, that's what we know as of this point in time. That's correct. And this, yes, good point, and, it, and it's subject to change, yes. Um, correct. So, yes. Any questions? No, just thank you also for the job you're doing. Thank you. It's a team effort. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. And if I may, could I be excused to give back? Yes, yes, sir. All right, next. Next, you have items for I consent. move for acceptance of items for consent. Second. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, so ordered. All right, number 12. Number 12 is items for decision. The county attorney is going to cover the adoption of legislative proposed goals. It's included. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Included in your package um, this week is a list of proposed legislative goals. This is a process that we, um, you are, most of you are familiar with as we begin the long session of the General Assembly for their 1920 biennium. Um, the North Carolina Association of County Commissioners, the advocacy group on behalf of all counties, um, is seeking proposed statewide legislative goals. Um, as we typically do in that process a month or so ago, I sent an email out to all department heads to solicit their input into goals um, for this upcoming term. A management team sat down, reviewed all of those goals, and we have prepared seven that are before you this morning for your consideration and, of course, open to any other or additional or different goals um, that the board may have on its own. The goals before you, just very briefly, the first two you've seen before, they usually um, mark every one of our goal lists. And number one is general revenue protection to keep the revenues that the current county currently receives in place. And then number two, to oppose unfunded mandates so that we can continue to spend those revenues on things that we are currently um, required to do and not have other unfunded burdens shifted to the county from the state or elsewhere. 
Number three is a topic you're also familiar with. It's to authorize maintenance bonds for subdivision streets. We've had that on our list in prior years. We've had the authority. The authority has then gone away. Um, and based on recent comments of this board, um, considered it still to be an important issue um, as we move forward. So that goal is back on your list. Number four, you've seen, um, you've had conversation about um, this past year, and that is to fully fund state responsibilities for public education. Number five, to assure adequate funding for county administered social services programs and avoid, di avoid diversion of those funds um, to places that they were not initially intended by the General Assembly. Number six is a new goal, which is to preserve confidentiality of animal surrender and adoption records. This, is, this may just be a local goal for Pitt County, um, but other counties across the state, or I should say one other county in particular, Guilford County, has, received, has a local act to keep those records confidential. The arena that comes up in is if you surrender a pet or if you adopt a pet um, in Pitt County, all of those records are open to the public as part of our public records laws. Sometimes, and we've had at least two occasions that I can recall in the past in Pitt County, where um, someone has surrendered a pet, that pet has then been subsequently adopted, and then the surrendering um, party will come to the shelter and say, let me make a public records request to obtain all of the information about who adopted my pet, and then they can go forward and um, reach out to that person or, or potentially otherwise harass that person about getting their pet back. So what some counties have done, or what Guilford County has done recently, is gotten authority to make the contact information for surrender and adoption confidential. I think that would be beneficial in Pitt County if this board were so inclined um, to take that act. And then the last thing um, is particular, this was brought to our attention by Dr. Morrow, and that's to repeal a law that went into effect this last short session about unpasteurized milk. Dr. Morrow has great concerns about the distribution or sale of unpasteurized milk um, and has pointed to a model um, in another state where a similar law was passed and it resulted in um, sickness um, which could lead to um, foreseeable death from the distribution of unpasteurized milk. And Dr. Morrow um, has been in conversation with um, Representative Greg Murphy and others um, who are supportive of the repeal of this particular bill. And so we've added that to the list. If you have any particular questions about these proposed goals, I'm happy to answer them, or any others that you'd like to add. Uh, on number three, the, at the end, it says, uh, <clears throat> accepted into the NCDOT state maintenance system when density requirements are met. Do we really want to say that? I know that's a law now, but that's part of the problem. If the legislature were to do away with having to have a certain amount of build out and as soon as the road is completed by regardless of build out by the uh, general contractor if they were forced to be adopted then this problem pretty much goes away so do we really want that on there or is this basically like taking a baby step maybe they'll give us some uh, the ability to be able to get some kind of guarantee but I think it would probably, with the board's concurrence, um, be fine to take that language off. Um, that doesn't mean that they, um, it will at least open up for further discussion um, the ability to adjust those density requirements or eliminate those density requirements. And you may recall several years ago there was a study um, that was ordered by the General Assembly to address these very issues, uh, and that was discussed at length in the study uh, with some recommendations for immediate acceptance at the time, the way cities operate. And so, yeah, I think that would be a good suggestion to just delete that language at the end and just say into the NCDOT state maintenance system. Thank you. Hey, everybody got that? Watch the pledge, you're asking about it. I'd like to make a motion yeah. that we accept this, Ms. Right. Chairman. I, yeah, yes, I'll but I just have that. two comments on the two new I, the two new ones. Mm -hmm. The uh, the uh, one there on the preservation of confidentiality of animal. I accept your position on that. Mm -hmm. I did not realize that was a problem at all, uh, but I'm not in the animal business. So <laughs> you think that is a good one for us to put on this list, right? I, do, I think it's one that would, it, this is not going to be your most important accomplishment right. ever, but I think it is one that will enhance the 
efficiency and performance of animal services, okay, and Michelle, I think it is achievable. Michelle supports this? Yes, yes she does. It. Okay. Now, uh, and one other comment. The one there about the, uh, the milk, do we have any dairy farmers in Pitt County? And mm -hmm. wh yeah. what is their position on this? And I understand Dr. Morris' position, but I just wonder if our dairy farmers are supportive of keeping this, or, 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 or are they supportive of repealing it? And I don't know that. I do know that some dairy farmers were, I don't know that they were in Pitt County, were supportive of this for it to have been added into the law last session. So you must have dairy farmers who are supportive of it. I'm not sure if they are in Pitt County or not in Pitt County, we and can I can find that out. What their position is, uh, and is there some uh, financial gain to our dairy farmers to have this law? Or? Uh, can you sell unpasteurized milk? It shouldn't be sold. You can sell it? That's, mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I know that's what this is inferring, yeah. but yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought back in, I thought that has been taken but care of. We could ask Lee Guth to um, report back to the board on that. Right, or Dr. Mara, who's done an extensive yeah, amount Mara. of work yeah, and looking I into this. Dr. Mara's position, and I support mm -hmm. Dr. Mara, but by the same token, I don't want us to do something that would be, that would hurt part of our farming community. So I would like to know what the dairy farmer's position is. I think your point's well taken, Jimmy. Since, since you say you can come back with it, Scott, is that what you're saying? Um, I think one issue we have on this list of goals is it has to be submitted to the Association of County Commissioners. What's the date, Janice? Um, September 24th. Um, and you meet again October 1st. I'm sorry, September 21st. I'm still some time. I mean, you, you don't, this is the only meeting we have this month. That's right. So September 21st is when the goals have to be to the NCACC. I think that we could um, submit those without that if there are outstanding questions and then come back to the board and um, determine whether or not you want to add that to your final goal just list. Amend or yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to make a motion out of paper? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we're going to strike that. I'll, I'll second, I'll second. That. All in favor and keep raising your right hand. All opposed. So All right. Yes. Next. Okay, next you have a recommendation for the naming of the basketball pickleball courts at the LSF Keene District Park. We have um, Ron Butler and Alice Keene who are going to present this recommendation. Good morning. Well, it, morning. Me, it, it makes me feel like you, I should ask you to stand up and take a stretch for a long morning. If you were in the park, we would do that. Um, I would like to uh, reintroduce um, my colleague um, and the new Community Schools and Recreation Director, Ron Butler, here with me this morning. And we feel that we have a very special uh, privilege and honor to bring this recommendation forward to you uh, for naming the basketball pickleball courts in our park. As prescribed um, in, in our policy for naming and dedication of parks and recreation areas, the attached recommendation for naming the basketball pickleball courts in our district park um, has been approved by our Community Schools and Recreation Advisory Council. As you can see on this map, the courts are located just south of our softball field, actually between the walking trail and our horseshoe court, so a very well used um, area of our park. Many of you know um, and have shared experiences with Phil Dickerson over the years. He's been one of the strongest advocates for community schools and recreation since the 1980s. At your appointment in 2002, Phil chaired the site feasibility study for location for a facility for Pitt County Council on Aging and their senior center and community schools and recreation. This is a, a picture from the final recommendation of that study and which time the recommendation was approved by the board to allot property for community schools and recreation center, which was the first home for community schools and recreation for the council on aging and their senior center and also 23.5 acres for our first district park. Now, all of us know Phil played a very key role in that study, in developing the scope of that study, and in that recommendation that was approved 
um, by this board. That was a real turning point for parks and recreation for our county. Last year, you'll remember again, the APA great public space celebration with the rope cutting of our natural trail. And again, Phil was right there with us as he has been so many times over the years with um, visiting Jacksonville Commons and then our support for our county home complex as well as our community build on our first playground. A very significant contribution that has made this whole project possible is a foundation gift from Chad Dickerson, Phil's son, of $16,000 to make this project possible. Um, Chad, in doing that, has, has a desire to honor his dad, but also to give back to his home community. As has become a tradition and is a tradition in our district park, this project is also a big team effort, planning, community schools and recreation, engineering, soil and water conservation, solid waste, buildings and grounds, all of our county departments coming together to make this possible. As you see today, we have uh, not only an outdoor basketball court area, but we have additionally two pickleball courts by pulling some resources together and being able to expand this project as much as, much as possible. <coughs> and we're waiting to put that goal up until we have everything in place, which our newest addition is the sod that has been placed around the court. I think for all of us, it will be very hard to find another person that is more dedicated to the citizens in Pitt County to improving their quality of life, a person more respected throughout our county than Phil Dickerson. For these reasons we've shared and many others, too numerous to, to name today, we do bring this, this recommendation forward to you uh, on behalf of the Community Schools and Recreation Advisory Council with the full support of the Planning and Recreation Community Schools um, staff. We'd be glad to answer Do we have a motion to have? approve this? Motion to no. approve. Motion made and seconded. Any discussion? Not all in favor indicate by raising your right hand. So ordered. Thank you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Next, you have a reappointment to the Pitt Area Transit System. Um, Mike Taylor will be up, up for reappointment. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. So ordered. Next. Next on the Pitt County Planning Board, you have four slots of individuals going off, representing two individuals from District 2, one from um, District 5, and one from District 6. You've got Walter Malloy, Matt Nobles, Kenneth Ross, and Anthony Herring. Um, three of them are going off, and, and one is resigned. And you have a list of names um, of people who have applied. I'd like to offer the, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'd like to offer the name of Steve Little, who uh, has expressed to me a personal interest in it. Uh, any others? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. We, we have four slots to fill. Uh, and I think with having four new people coming on, it is really important that we have some experience. So I have looked at these applications, and I have three names that I would like to submit. And I know that we normally do one apiece, but I'm going to submit these three. And three the board wants to, to with the one. And right. With the one, and that would be the four. Sounds so good. So I would like to submit uh, David Davenport. If you look at his resume, I think he would be an asset to the board. And also Ashley Moore. He is currently on the Board of Adjustments, and I know we normally like to have people from the Board of Adjustments to move up to the planning board. So he would be, uh, would have some experience. And then the third one, would be Joseph Allen, who is currently on the Winnable Planning and Zoning Board. So I think he would lend some experience to this board. So I would uh, move that we uh, appoint those three in addition to the one that married me. Thank you. And there'll be no further uh, nominations. All in favor of those four, raise your right hand. All opposed, so ordered. Next. Okay, next on the Farm and Food Council, you have a recommendation for reappointment of Mayor Gorstein Brown. I so move. Second. All in favor, raise your right hands. Thank you. Next. Next on the um, Greenville Planning and Zoning Board, we have a reappointment recommendation for um, Kenneth Wilson. 
Anybody else? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor, raise your right hand. All opposed, so ordered. And then this other business. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the last item we have is that NCDOT de debris removal agreement you have before you. We added to the agenda. Again, this just gives Pitt County the option, if we so choose, to pick up vegetative debris. Now, we're not, it's not construction debris, but vegetative debris on the um, the road right of ways. And we would we would specify in writing to DOT once a, a storm has came through what roads we wanted to um, have that option to to do this. This does not require us to do it. It just gives us the option. And this is what we've done in the past. Right? Well, we've never well, had I, a motion. we've never had a formal agreement. I think with Hurricane Matthew two years ago, we, we did, did go out there. We just we did do it. We did it. Yeah, without okay. permission. But. I thought we I'd like done to it. Yeah. offer the motion that we accept the recommendation from our manager. Yeah, second to that. Second. Uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. So ordered. Any further business? Yes, no. sir. Comments, Ann? Uh, no comments. Jimmy? No comments. Charles? We have four people to resign from the planning board? No, no three, three terms were, were they, they, their terms were up after they're been they on there. One person years. resigned. Oh, oh. One of the four. Okay. Just, that's one no. Beth? None. Mary? I'd like to say if the emergency management uh, personnel uh, recommend that you evacuate your home i like to say the district too please do so and respect them and evacuate follow their instructions if you have medicine that your life depends on pack it now so all you have to do is grab your bag and go please respond to the emergency management uh, recommendations thank you district two for your support tom none melvin yeah um Mr. Manager, I'd like to just thank all of you for your prayers and your, your cars, uh, your, your phone calls and your visits and all the other acts of kindness shown during the uh, passing of my wife. Uh, your prayers certainly has been a comfort to me and your visits has been a very comfort. And I ask you to solicit, continue to solicit your prayers and your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in, all in favor, raise your right hand. So, thank you. <laughs>